two nights? Yeah. Two nights, yeah. You, you, do the, you do the short straw, Dave. You have to see me twice in a week. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, just on the phone with Nickham, and I let him know that it seems like the only time I ever see him is as a, you know, a Brady Bunch window in some meeting somewhere. <laughs> yeah. So, Agnes, did you work out with Angela that you're going to, she's going to share the screen or whatever for a presentation? Yes, I think we're all set as far as that goes, right? Yep. Excellent. Hello. Thank you. Hello? Hello. Hey, Agnes, were you able to get it off Dropbox? Yes. Hi. Guys, can you hear me? Hi. Yes, we can. Uh, can you? Um, this is Laura Tugwell, and I'm working from home today, and so I didn't get the link to be able to join with the com on the computer, so I can see all the slides. Is there any way that you can send me that at home? Yes, or I could just tell you. We could just tell you the uh, the link ID. If okay, you want. that'd be great too. Yes, please. Okay, so let me get to that. The link ID. So it's meet.google.com forward slash A M E dash K V C N dash C Q J. Is that C as in Charlie? Q J? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read it back to you. Um, A M E dash K Z T N dash C Q J. V as in Victor after, after K. Okay, great. Okay, V, T, N, C, Q, J. Got it. Thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Okay. All right. What do you think, Jeff? Should we get started? I think everybody's here. I'm looking. Um, Scott and John and Michael DePayo. I see Michael's at it. Oh, there he is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and Lynette. Even mm -hmm. though Lynette says Andrea. <laughs> Lynette, do you want to just raise your hand? And you're muted too, so. So we'll, I'll, I'll just uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order, and we'll know that um, everybody is here. Um, the first thing we have are our public appearances. And members of the public are entitled to speak on matters of municipal concern, not on the agenda during public appearances. Each person's comments shall be limited to three minutes, yada, yada. Matters not appearing on the committee's agenda will not receive action at this meeting, but may refer to staff for a future meeting. You're not required to give your name, but it's helpful for us. Any members of the public wish to speak? Okay. We have no items on the consent agenda. Um, I would announce that we are not uh, we were not able to schedule the PG&E hearing for today, so we are going to uh, we'll just uh, put that off for another meeting. Um, but we should proceed with the first item. Receive a presentation from the Monterey Regional Waste Management District on greenhouse gas reduction strategies. And Carrie, would you like to do the honors? Certainly. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, we have a wonderful presentation that was um, created um, by Angela, who's the public education and outreach specialist. And um, she's going to be helped by the general manager of the Waste District, Tim Flanagan. And he has been with the district for 38, uh, he's been in the, the waste uh, business for 38 years. He's been with the district for 15. And the last five years, he has been at the helm, um, leading the way for the waste management district. So it's definitely more than just a landfill or dump, what you're going to see today. So uh, take it away, Tim and Angela. Thanks. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I want to introduce my colleague, Angela Goebel, as uh, introduced. And Angela did the the EO person's work in, in putting this together. So uh, with that, we'll uh, start up the presentation. Uh, Angela, if you wanna share. All right, this is my first time doing this on Google, so let's see if we can get it. <laughs> we're, we're now multiversed on, on uh -oh. different platforms, so we're trying to learn as we go. 
You know, I'm getting an error message saying my browser can't share my screen, so I'm going to quickly switch browsers. I'll be right back. All right. Well, I'll wait for the I'll wait for the slides to catch up, yeah, and uh, give you a little them. bit of a little bit of a background on the history of the district. Is that uh, we were actually uh, formed in 1951. Uh, we've been uh, at it around 69 years now. Uh, if you didn't know, we we're publicly owned and publicly operated. Uh, we have about a $38 million operating budget. Um, we're a regional facility for waste handling, processing, and disposal. Uh, it's 470 acres. This is an example of very good uh, planning in that the, the four, four persons from the district when back in the mid-early 60s, I should say, bought this large 470-acre location. Um, we currently have about between 75 and 100 years of disposal capacity left. God help us if we use it all. Um, that means we're not doing our job if we fill up the landfill to its entirety. That, that means we will have failed in our mission. Um, and we, uh, we have about 120 employees and we have nine appointed members of the board that uh, sit there. And Madam Tice has been our chair the last couple of years. So, um, we're bordered once the slide comes up, if it does, um, on uh, the east uh, by uh, agriculture and and on the south by agriculture and the north, we're bordered by the Salinas River. So were we able All right. to- Let me, I'm gonna, this is gonna be a little tricky because I, can you verbally let me know if you can see the PowerPoint? Okay. Yes. Okay, great. We can't right now. I'm not going to be able to see you all. So, uh, Tim, if you could verbally let me know when to advance that I will. Just... Yep. We'll, we'll do. None um, of the slides are up now, just so you know. We can't see anything now. Oh, no? No. no. Okay. Um, so, there we go. Okay. it looks like it's coming up, Angela. There we go. All right. Um, you know, advance. There we go. We're we're almost getting it there. You want to uh, put it in slideshow mode? Yeah. Okay. Is there that you go. okay? Oh, so you you saw that? That's the overhead view of us. You can advance the slide, Angela. Um, the next slide. Um, there we go. There you go. So if you, this is a picture from our webpage. So if you're after the meeting, if you would like, you can go to our webpage and you can click on the little circles that we have in there and you'll have short videos around each segment of our facility. And as uh, Carrie mentioned, we are a lot more than a landfill. We're a fully integrated facility that uh, owes the planning of the board members uh, that we've had in the past and most, most notably, our director, Gary Bales, who has been on our board for 51 years. And uh, Gary has been an architect of a lot of the development that we have. So we're an integrated facility. Our facility is designed to divert as much material as we can from, from the waste stream. So after the meeting, go to the web page and you can click on the little videos on our, from our uh, web page and, and hear them. So with that, we'll advance it to the next slide, and Angela is going to talk to you about greenhouse gas emissions and what the district is doing in our programs to reduce that. So this is a nice um, iconographic. It shows, you know, there are energy emissions and greenhouse gas emissions associated with um, mining raw materials, manufacturing them into products, and then um, the end of life, which is where we come in with waste management. So, you know, there are different options for how you manage those materials. And as Tim said, we're trying to find the highest and best use for them by turning waste into resources. So there are positive benefits to recycling and composting, as you can see, uh, by recovering that material and um, conserving energy in comparison to raw mining and material extraction. But along the way, there are some um, small emissions as well. So 
this is where the hierarchy of reduce, reuse, recycle comes in. Um, the best and highest uh, action is to not generate the waste or consume the material. Um, and then, of course, like what we're trying to avoid is landfilling material. We are trying to support a circular economy in, with our activities. Um, so a closed loop economy, um, you're aiming to extend the life of those um, resources. And again, have the highest and best use. So this is where um, we're conserving resources. Um, well, the quality of the products can remain the same. So it's a, a systems, large scale systems thinking. You have to have all the pieces um, lined up. You have to have um, markets and manufacturers that are gonna take those um, recycled products and, and uh, materials and make them into new products. Um, consumers have to purchase those products or there has to be consumer demand. Um, products that are made out of recycled materials. And then you have to have the systems to capture them, um, like our collection with our haulers or um, our drop-off programs um, and, and redirect them into that closed loop. Um, this is also where having a repair economy is um, really big. You know, you again, you're trying to extend the life of the product as much as possible and have as little go to waste Ideally, this would be a completely closed loop system um, where we're not extracting resources from the environment and we're not wasting. But of course, there are challenges to that. So we're trying to um, close that gap as much as we can. Thanks, thanks, Angela. So along the area of uh, greenhouse gas reductions, uh, when recycling first began to get its uh, feet underneath it, which was in the late 70s, um, early 80s, one of the main reasons that recycling was trumpeted was its ability to save energy by conversion of material uh, from recycled material back into usable products. And you can see on the slide presented there some of the savings. And if you remember coming out of the 70s, there is a huge emphasis on uh, energy savings. And that was one of the first things that began to give recycling traction across the country about there's not only a benefit uh, from the product itself, but also an energy savings from the conversion of that product back into new material. And as you can see on the slide depicted there, uh, in 2018, we opened up our retrofitted material recovery facility. Uh, we spent uh, close to $27 million in, in doing that. And uh, this year, uh, even just two years later, the technology is advanced that we added another three and a half million dollars in technology for optical sorting and sorting by uh, technology. Our next avenue will be uh, for the addition of robots, probably will have a place in our in our next MRF. On to the next slide, we talk about from the landfill itself. The landfill acts as sort of a giant tomb, and the, there's a covering below the landfill to prevent the landfill leakage called leachate from getting into the groundwater. And then there's a garbage above it, and then it's capped. So it affects, uh, it makes, in essence, a tomb. In that tomb is where the decomposition of the material is created. And that material, that methane gas, has been taken from the district and converted to beneficial use. Last year, the district landfilled 564,000 tons of material. And when it takes place, it takes place in an anaerobic environment, similar to what happens in your in your gut with limited or no oxygen. The reason why we want to get methane out of the environment is it's estimated to be between 21 and 72 times stronger a greenhouse gas than CO2. You go to the next slide, we'll show this was our first effort to make uh, extraction of methane from the landfill back in 1983. The district was one of the first landfills in the country to mine the methane for conversion to electricity. 
that engine that you see there was a first model that, that came in and was very rudimentary, but started us off on the path. If you go on to the next slide, and that's my predecessor there, that was William Mary there, tending to the landfill gas system. This is what our new building, which was built in the uh, late 1990s, is. It houses, it houses now four engines, engine generators, that generate a total of five megawatts of power. That's about enough for 3,000 homes, roughly, on an, on an annualized basis. The inset picture you see there is called a flare, which does exactly what it sounds like. It burns any excess gas uh, that comes from the landfill and destructs it so that it does not get into the, the atmosphere. So uh, the CO2 offset from using this is worth about 27,000 tons a year from our making use of this. And our next phase of this is we're actively now uh, working on the construction project with our, our neighbors, Monterey One Water, to take our renewable power, about two megawatts, and transfer that to M1W that's going to make your renewable water for the peninsula. So it's very unique in the whole country to have renewable power make renewable water. And that's really because of the vision of the predecessors at our district and at M1W that put those together so that you could have that uh, symbiosis of use of the two entities. We're also going to do to advance to the next slide, Angela. By the end of, probably by the summer of this year, we will be also be taking our landfill gas and converting it to vehicle fuel. When you selected your vendor in 2015, all the vendors were required to run on compressed natural gas, CNG fuel, with the vision that ultimately these trucks that pick up the trash and recycling and green waste in your neighborhoods will be run on landfill gas. That is a carbon negative fuel. It has a negative intensity because you're using a renewable fuel for that gas. So in essence, you're feeding yourself. You are feeding the gas into the trucks that come back into your neighborhoods and pick up the material. This is very, very unique. There's only a few locations across the country are doing this. And when you made the decision as a group to co-locate the vehicle uh, yard out on our facility, that's a 30-year investment. You own that as a public. You own that facility. You don't have to pay that back to any of the private haulers that would come and pick up your garbage. So that's an investment that you made as a community into your long-term solid waste planning. And in the future, we can also add in uh, uh, CNG from organics that Angela is going to talk to you about in the next series of slides. Angela? So it's really positive that we have this methane collection and conversion um, system on our site. But of course, one of the downsides is um, we are landfilling all of that um, material. It's unlikely we're going to recover it. I know Tim <laughs> thinks that there might be a future where we mine it, but um, pretty nasty stuff. And the best thing we can do is um, uh, make the best of it before we landfill it. So composting, um, we've had yard trimmings composting on the peninsula um, since the 1980s. Um, so this is your green bin. Um, we also get a large volume of material from landscapers who drive directly to us. And we work with Keith Day Company, uh, he's a private business that operates on our site and he's uh, doing windrow composting. So this is industrial uh, scale commercial composting. It's a little bit different than what you might do in your backyard in the sense that it gets to a really high heat. Um, they are monitoring it to make sure the conditions are optimal to help the uh, microorganisms like fungi and protozoa and bacteria um, metabolize the organic material quickly. Um, so these piles um, with the metabolic activity, they get up to 145 degrees. 
and um, they're constantly taking the temperature. They're aerating the um, compost windrows, so they have machines that turn them over to introduce oxygen. And then in the summer months when it's drier, we're making sure they're making sure it's nice and moist. Um, so this is a 90 to 120 day process where he's mixing that, those yard trimmings with some uh, maybe cow manure, some uh, grape hummus from vineyards locally, and producing a really high quality compost, which is OMRI listed. That's the Organics Materials Review Institute. Um, and that's certified for use on organic farms. So this material, we have very robust market for it um, with agriculture. It's going to strawberry and lettuce uh, row crops. And um, Keith Day has been a really great partner uh, to manage our organics processing. Now, this is actually really huge uh, composting. Uh, the California Carbon Project began as the Marin Carbon Project in the 1990s, late 1990s. And it was a partnership with UC Davis, UC Berkeley, the researchers there, and ranchers up in Marin County. And, you know, they had anecdotal evidence that applying compost to grasslands was really beneficial. But the scientists wanted to really measure what was going on with the CO2 emissions. Was it um, emitting more? Was it emitting less? So they um, set up a number of pilot projects with different uh, ranches in the area. Um, they spread out that compost, which you can see in the photo in the background. And what they found was the application of just a quarter inch of compost um, benefited the soil environment for over 100 years. And what happened is um, it made the grass happy. I mean, if you garden, it should be pretty obvious. Putting compost um, in your garden beds, the, the plants are going to thrive. Um, they're going to, it's going to um, have the roots go deeper, and those are made out of carbohydrates. So they're pulling CO2 out of the atmosphere and sinking them into the ground. And then the plant um, thrives. Um, there's more water retention. You're changing the soil structure. So it's both um, that change in soil structure and um, the introduction of nutrients, which is helping this um, ecosystem, grass ecosystem um, benefit. So again, one application of a quarter of an inch of compost, they did all their, their uh, mathematical calculations and they found that it would help the grasslands for over a hundred years. And this is really big because um, this light green area on this map, this is all our rangelands or grasslands in California. It's a significant amount of geography. And they did their calculations and they found that if we applied compost to just half of this area, it would completely offset all of our energy emissions in California, all of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and then if we went a step further and we're like, okay, we're just gonna get all of it covered in compost. Again, one application, years of benefit. And then we become a carbon bank. Then we're pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and this is really what we need to do to reverse climate change. Um, you know, in talks around sustainability, um, we talk a lot about reducing greenhouse gas emissions. And one example I like to give when I'm doing like school tours is like, I drive a Prius. Well, I'm still putting gas in my Prius. Um, you know, there's still a lot of um, raw materials that went into creating this vehicle. So I'm still admitting it's just better than um, a more conventional car. But we need these solutions where um, we're working to reverse climate change, where we already have too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, so we're starting to take it out. So this was part of Governor um, Brown's climate action plan, but, you know, you need, you need that whole system set up, like I talked about the closed loop um, economy. And so CalRecycle, they do um, waste characterizations. So they're looking at what are people in California throwing away. Um, they did a study in 2017 and found 
67% of our waste stream included organics. And, you know, they segmented it out. Um, you know, paper is considered an organic and lumber. But then we have food, we have yard trimmings. Um, so they're looking at um, this waste composition. They're also looking at um, uh, food insecurity in the state. They're, they're thinking, you know, that we, we need to have, um, we need to drive these materials out of the landfill. Number one, because of the methane emissions, but we have all these other problems like um, hunger in California. And this is true more than ever. Tim and I were just on a call with the director of the food bank, um, Melissa, last week. And with the pandemic, um, Monterey County, the food bank is feeding 53% of the population locally. Um, so, and, and we are the, actually the most food insecure county in the whole state. So locally, this is um, definitely a priority. And this is the food recovery hierarchy that EPA developed. So we're looking at what is the best way, best use for food organics. And of course, number one is create less of it. You know, we shouldn't grow or purchase food that we're just gonna throw away. Um, then feed people, then feed animals, then get that energy from it and also compost it compost it, and then landfilling is the least desirable outcome. So again, going back to um, the state's plan around this, uh, there have been a number of laws passed, especially in the last decade, that are looking at uh, driving organics out of the landfill, getting them composted or um, to hungry people, and just finding the most beneficial uh, use for them that also helps uh, mitigate climate change. AB 1826 was passed in 2014. This piece of legislation was really about getting businesses signed up for organic services. Um, so this has been a really great tool when um, our haulers like Green Waste and Carmel have approached restaurants or other um, businesses that generate food and they can point to the law and be like, you're actually required and Agnes probably has referenced this law quite a bit. Um, and then more recently, we have SB 1383, which was passed a few years ago, but has really um, taken a while to totally form in rulemaking and implement. So uh, Tim is gonna delve into this. It's a huge piece of legislation. Thank, thanks, thanks, Angela. Thanks. Um, uh, one, one of the things I think is important to um, to bring forward is um, these two pieces of legislation. Of course, the state passed this, and for us as local government, um, of course, there was not any funding attached to that legislation. So uh, we are going to be responsible for generating our own funding and doing this in the most cost-effective way we can. Just to give you an idea that the, the district in the last five years, we have uh, put out uh, close to $50 million worth of bonds for our infrastructure developed here, and we still have to tackle the organics uh, scenarios which are presenting here. And that's, we have to divert 75% of organic material from the landfill by 2025, and we have to designate 20% of food for recovery. And, and that's gonna be a, a tall order. So how are we gonna do it? Next slide, Angela. Um, we're gonna look to partner, obviously, with existing organizations who are already in the existing food recovery business. These folks have been doing this for a number of years. What we're gonna have to do, though, is something we have not done in the past, which is document that, track that, submit that information to the state, and provide inspections on the type of work that we're doing in line with that to the state. So that's going to be an administrative barrier that we have not ever had to do before, both from ourselves and on the generators. And this will also mean that the generators of food waste restaurants, institution, hotels, et cetera, will also have to do 
that record keeping themselves and report this up through the system. Next slide, Angela. We're gonna to have to do a lot more of what we've already been doing. And that means that we're uh, going to be discussing and hopefully, uh, we're not letting the cat out of the bag, but uh, we'll be bringing residential food waste into your green waste cart probably sometime this year. That'll be a pilot program that we'll be running throughout the district. And we're having that discussion now with the haulers and our processor on how to phase that in. So we've had commercial food recovery for quite some time. And that was initiated by the local businesses actually in the Monterey Peninsula. They came to the district in the late 2000s and said, we wanna do this. And the district uh, made that happen. Now you as a resident are going to have that opportunity happen, uh, hopefully uh, at, your, at your curb and we're gonna be running a phased in approach on that we think over this next 12 to 18 months. So what does that mean with all this material we gather? Next slide, Angela. We're, we're gonna have to be doing more windrow composting, but we're gonna have to do it differently and at higher expense. We'll, we'll essentially have to make compost sort of be like Jiffy Pop. It has to have a covering over it and put air in there to make the compost work. I couldn't think of another meta, you know, analogy, but it's like Jiffy Pop. You gotta cover it up and feed the air into it to make it, to make it work so that it will compost and not have any release of any of their emissions from composting you know, into the atmosphere. And this is something the Air District is going to make us, uh, make us do and is making us do statewide. And you also have to control the water runoff and water emission off of the compost itself. The district is gonna be spending two and a half million dollars in the next few months to prep the site uh, for make it compliant with the Regional Water Quality Control Board. But we'll need a couple of other avenues to do organics management besides that. Next slide, Angela. And we're gonna look to partner with our, with our neighbor next door, M1W. They may have the ability to, to have one of their spare digesters, and this is wet anaerobic digestion. Currently, your sewage, although you and Carmel go to COD, similar circumstance happens out at M1W. That happens in an oxygen uh, starved environment and it's a wet anaerobic digestion. That wet product and wet material goes through there. It decomposes, it releases a methane that's contained and captured for reuse. And then the discharge, if you can see in that slide off to the right, that's the residual solids. It goes by another name, but I'll just call it residual solids for now that is dried out in the, in the open air. So, and, and in, by 2025, that material will no longer be able to be landfilled. So we're gonna have to develop a beneficial use for that material, the biosolids as well. And then we also expect, next slide, Angela, that the district was fortunate enough to have about a six year pilot program. You can see that uh, with the, uh, I guess, is that chartreuse on the doors? I'm guessing. Um, yeah. So with the chartreuse doors, that was our dry anaerobic digester. That is a dry system where the material was put into that, inoculated, it broke down in a contained atmosphere the methane was extracted and we converted that for sale over six years to, to M1W. That was a very small pilot. It only handled about 7,000 tons a year. For our community, we will need something that will probably be 10 times that size. And that's more like the facility depicted in the future slide that you have over there. And there are some communities that have been doing this for a while. Uh, the city of San Jose has been doing it for a while. There's another community in uh, Southern California in Rialto that is converting that and putting that into the pipeline for gas, uh, for a replacement for natural gas. So we will be evaluating that over the next 
of several, a uh, couple of three years anyway, to come up with what works best for us in the Monterey Peninsula. And, and unfortunately, that will also have a cost impact with that, as you can imagine. So um, there's a good future. The future is designed to keep the climate protected, to keep these emissions from going into the atmosphere. Uh, we have a good infrastructure built already. And as you know, in Carmel, you were the first community on the Monterey Peninsula to do curbside recycling way back in 1982. So no more, probably you will end up being the leaders in our organic management as well. So that ends our presentation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Tim and Angela. Um, as you can see, folks, uh, there's a lot going on out at the district, just north of Marina there. Um, and you can also see why your garbage rates are going up because <laughs> there's a lot that has to be done um, to process the garbage, to reduce methane, and to reduce um, filling the landfill. So are there any questions that uh, out there? I know it's a lot of material, but who's got it? some questions they would like to ask? Michael? Uh, thank you. That was a really good presentation. Um, when do you... Uh, think the uh, demand for the capacity at the landfill is going to be exceeded or is that i mean that, it sounds like it's a little bit of a function of how quickly these programs that you're mandated come online if if you mean if you mean by disposal um i i would expect and i'm, I'm not trying to be facetious that we should never ever use all our capacity at the landfill that that should the 75 or 100 years of capacity in current practice, I would expect that we will invent and develop systems that will do a lot more reduction upstream as well as downstream, you know, over the next even generation. So uh, I will tell you this, that uh, as, the, as the district evolves over time, um, well, that should be a landfill for the Monterey Peninsula in perpetuity for whatever smidgen is is left uh, that has to be disposed of. Um, so I would I would hope we never fill the, the landfill, Michael. We should never do that. That's the goal. Yeah, that's the goal. Thank you. Um, Carrie, thank you. Um, absolutely fascinating presentation. Thank you both so much. Um, it's obviously something that should be on all of our minds to do a much better job than we do. I have um, two questions, actually. The first has to do with the residential food recovery for human use. Is there a role that is played by the district in that, or is that under the auspices of some other agency or organization? So if you wanted to cover it, yeah. Sure. I mean, if we want to get super technical, it's going to be the city that's um, held accountable by the state. But um, the district is really um, helping to guide the process. We have um, a technical advisory committee made up of our different jurisdictions. And um, we're trying to really facilitate collaborative decision making, um, both with government entities, um, you know, nonprofits like the food bank. Our, our waste haulers. Um, and in the case of edible food recovery, um, you know, this looks different in every county in the state, how they're choosing to approach it. Mm -hmm. We're really trying to leverage existing partnerships and programs and make them more robust. Um, and so we're trying to help direct resources to existing programs. But um, one thing that will fall to the city and most likely to us as partners with the city or um, is the reporting aspect that Tim mentioned. Mm -hmm. There is a lot of onerous reporting and there's already a lot of food recovery happening. You know, we talked to Melissa at the food bank and she's, we want to develop a more formal program where employees can take home food from restaurants and that counts as food recovery because, you know, there are people in need already. Right. 
but that activity is probably already taking place. It's just a matter of like adding more bureaucracy and administrative paperwork. Food bank has to check off that like, oh, this is being handled um, with food safety requirements and the mm -hmm. food happening and quantifying it. So unfortunately, I think the legislation has really good intentions around edible food recovery, but it's actually adding quite a, a more barriers like all that time we're going to have to spend with that paperwork and reporting could better be used as a resource with money, I think, to like buy food for the people that are hungry. So we're going to probably be having a dialogue with the state as it rolls out to, mm -hmm. you know, this is working, but this isn't. And maybe we can amend it in the long term to especially, um, you know, Melissa was saying, um, you know, our county is different from so many counties in the state. So um, a big city might be able to put a food truck on the uh, a truck on the road and go business to business and collect edible food and go to a centralized location. But our county is 3,700 square miles. Right. Is that right? Was that the right statistic? Yeah. It just sounds mind blowing. It just doesn't sound right coming out of my mouth. But um, so, yeah, I, I think um, we're going to roll with it and uh, mm -hmm do the best we can, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if we have to like um, get creative and work with the state in the long term to make it more functional locally. Thank you. That's, uh, that's great information. My second question has to do with hazardous waste and what is the uh, percentage of hazardous waste that is collected in the district now? Uh, by comparison to all waste. And then what do you see as the future of hazardous waste treatment? So let me let me tackle that. So um, I, I, I cannot resist this. So um, <laughs> I will share with you uh, something that our, our state decided to do. Um, how many of you know what pressure treated wood is? Yeah, you know, typically that's wood that's been treated, right? That, you know, we build now on our decks, et cetera, everybody has pressure treated wood. For the last number of years, pressure treated wood, when it was ready to be disposed of, was able to go to our landfill, which has a plastic liner, sort of acts as a diaper, and, and be disposed of there. There was a bill that would enable that to continue. The, the governor vetoed that bill the end of last year, and now, all your pressure treated lumber has to be treated as a hazardous waste. There's only one facility in the state of California that is able to take that pressure treated wood. And has anybody been to Button Willow? Yes. I, I have. <laughs> it's, I know where that is. <laughs> it's a long ways away from nobody. Um, yeah. And it costs us $7,000 to take what is a, essentially one debris box to that location for disposal. Wow. So um, back to your question on household hazardous waste. We've had a robust system here. Uh, we have, I think we average uh, close to, uh, I think it was 15 or 18,000 turn-ins last year, uh, Angela, I think if that's the, the number. Um, Pre-pandemic, we also hosted an annual uh, collection program at usually at MPC. Yep. So we're we're doing a better job. And and to give you a little more feedback, that the future of hazardous waste is going to come from what we call extended producer responsibility, and that means mm -hmm. that the manufacturers of the product have to pay at the front end to pull that material through the system. We, we have that now for uh, of all things mattresses. We, we right. have it for carpet. We, we have it for tires. We have it for computers and electronic waste. And what we're really gonna need it for is things like batteries because the, the district experiences probably an average of somewhere between three and five small fires at our landfill every week that are caused by the lithium ion batteries that are being disposed of and they're becoming more and more prevalent 
Mm-hmm. And there was a, a facility in San Carlos uh, three years ago that a brand faci- brand new facility, very much like ours, that burnt down to the ground uh, or bur- ruined all the equipment in it uh, because of a battery fire. And, and this is somewhere we have to get the consumers and the residents to have the appropriate disposal. Mm-hmm. So I think the future is uh, is is ex- extended producer responsibility and managing that material that way. Okay. Over time. Thank you. Tim could go on forever on this one, um, but I'm going to cut him off. Um, uh, I have three more people that have asked questions. Um, Andrea, you've been patient. Go ahead. Oh, no. Andrea is me, um, Carrie. Oh, oh, I'm just okay. using right. a different computer. Right. Sorry. Okay. So, Lib... Um, Libby Barnes, go ahead. Hi, thank you for your uh, really informative um, talk. Um, I'm an architect, and but I am a um, avid recycler, and I'm curious about your education, um, educating the public, because I feel like I see stuff go into the waste, you know, into recycle bins. For instance, now the very new a lot of restaurants using compostable uh, plastics that can't go into recycling and people are confused by this the little number one is hard to see so what are you going to do to um, you know educate the public about the new organics well let's see who wants to take that one on Um, that one's one we discuss all the time at the district Um, and it's really both the district's issue and the haulers issue to try to educate the public. And um, uh, so we're constantly trying to educate the public on that one. Um, Angela or Tim, do you wanna go into any more detail? But that is certainly a big challenge. Yeah, Angela. So yeah, we we take a really multi-pronged approach We do work closely with our haulers because they have more direct contact with you, um, with their newsletters, with um, truck signs, brochures, you know, they're out in the community. But um, Zoe and I, we're the education team right now. She's on the call. She's um, our director of communications. Um, And we we do we do advertising. on a larger scale in the newspaper, on the radio, on um, Facebook. Media. Um, yeah, social media is, is bigger now because, you know, we can stretch our dollars a little further, like in the sense that we can reach more people. But one of our challenges, like, you know, our audience is is everyone, you know, <laughs> and um, definitely Western Monterey County, but now we're even receiving recyclables from um, the rest of the county and beyond. Uh, we did come up with the What Goes Where website and app as a resource, which mm-hmm. we're tr- still yeah. trying to make sure people know about it. Um, uh, and then with SB 1383 with the organics, yes, we're going to have to do very robust outreach so people know that the program exists, that they can put food waste in their yard trimmings cart, but also what what belongs in that cart. And, and yes, it is, we are trying to figure out what are those materials um, because we, ha- we do have some of these local uh, food service where ordinances where we're trying to get businesses to shift, um, cities have been trying to get businesses to shift to non-disposable options. So there's been a push to get compostable forks, but they look so similar to plastic forks. And then the question will, that we're trying to work out is, are those gonna be accepted on the residential level or are those only gonna be accepted at businesses? The, it's it's pretty com- complex, um, the ecosystem of, because yeah, the education determines um, what you as like a consumer are purchasing and or a member of the public and like what you're doing with that material. And it is really difficult to keep track of all the rules because it can be different city to city in the States. And and they seem to be changing. in my head, but I don't expect yeah. anyone else to. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and and I uh, just had one other quick, yeah, quick uh, follow up to that too. 
Yeah, I just had one other follow up to that um, quickly. Um, we just see more and also on recycling more and more of the soft pack, the number seven. That seems like every all our food from rice to to dog treats are coming in. Um, is that something that your facility um, can see handling in the foreseeable future? No, there's there's just not a market. Um, mm -hmm. The material, I mean, the it with sustainability, there are all these trade offs. Like it is a lighter packaging material, so there are energy savings and greenhouse gas, gas emission savings with the shipping of that material because it's less bulky. But then when you're looking at the end of life, like there's no way to um, recycle it. And even, you know, even plastics, um, it, they're, they degrade over time. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, considered downcycling where we can make it in a plastic water bottle into a carpet, but then at, at that stage, at the end of the carpet's life, we can't do something with it. So. This is, this is where um, Tim mentioned we need to go upstream. We need to go into the, the companies manufacturing these items, into the design. Um, this is where producer, extended producer responsibility laws can be really beneficial. Um, because sometimes, you know, as the a waste management district, there's only so much we can do with the, the materials we get. So if we can go upstream and ensure that the materials we receive can be recycled, or composted, that's more ideal. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna go on to Jeff had a question and then back uh, to Catherine. Go ahead, Jeff. Hi, Tim, thanks for coming. Um, very informative, uh, appreciate all the work that you guys do. I have a really down to earth question. We compost all of our food waste here at the house. And I, we have a couple of bins and we take the food waste every couple of days and we take it out to the bins and we put it in there. So my first question is, is that, you know, with relation to greenhouse gases, you know, I noticed when you were talking about composting food waste, you were talking about putting it in big piles and then covering it to sort of retain the methane that uh, uh, presumably the decomposition of this food waste uses. Obviously, I can't do that. I don't, I don't have any way to recapture the methane. So should I be composting my food waste or should I be sending it to you? No, you, you, can, um, you can do it fine. So first of all, you're doing aerobic composting. So that does not produce methane. Um, that does have other uh, CO2 emissions, but when you compost aerobically, you are not producing methane. Yeah, I'm constantly turning it over. Yeah. So it's very aerobic. It, it's only... It's only when you do it anaerobically that like under the ground in the landfill or in the vessel at the sewage okay. that methane is, is created. So doing it aerobically, you're fine. And in fact, in a mass balance thing, doing it in your backyard is better than even putting into a carbon negative truck and hauling it out to, to us to do it. Okay. So the next question, the sort of the follow on question to that is, you know, the current rage these days with home composting is getting these worms, you know, having uh, compo using worms to do the yeah. composting. Now we just put ours outside and eventually the earthworms find it and <laughs> they do some of the work and the air does the rest of the work. But should I, does it matter for the atmosphere if I uh, invest in, you know, a couple of pounds of these no expensive, hard to manage red worms, or can I just keep using my pile in the back? From a greenhouse gas emission standpoint, they're both equally good. Just as a gardener, there might be um, the some benefits to the worm composting where you get like this really concentrated nutrient rich, um, and it uh, they're called worm castings. Um, and then you could, they, they can also, if you, if you, dilute them in water and spray it on plants. It can be like um, a pesticide. Right. So it's really only from a gardening perspective or, you know, if some people live in apartments and they don't have a backyard to do the backyard composting, but from an emission standpoint, they're both great. Okay, well, thank you. Being an earthworm is a great life. You, you eat, you reproduce, and you excrete. It's a very simple life for them, so. Uh no, no, Tim says encourage it. Okay, so uh, to Catherine, 
your turn. <laughs> okay, my question is pretty quick. It's for Angela. Um, I just wanted to get this uh, number correct. You said if we put a quarter inch of compost over half of our rangeland, it would offset all our what? Could you clarify the emissions? All of the energy emissions in the state are greenhouse gas emissions. So it's pretty cool. So, uh, you know, all of our driving and transportation, all of the electricity from, you know, commercial manufacturing or homes, all of that is offset by this quarter inch. And then it, 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 it keeps giving, you know, the one application year after year after year. So it's, it's pretty huge and um, it's, it's straightforward and simple enough, but it's creating the systems to support it. It's mm -hmm. Getting that material, the infrastructure to compost that material. There's gonna be a lot more facilities set up in the state. And like Tim said, we're gonna be doing some um, infrastructure improvements, but then it's also getting that to the, the farmers and ranchers and mm -hmm. having like carbon um, credit programs. So they're incentivized to do it or they're educated about the benefit of, of doing it. So this is a long-term goal, right? Yep. Very yeah, long. yeah. What um, an amazing fact. Yeah. We can share the slide deck, Anya, if there's a way, you know, this, this is public information. So you just, anybody that wants the slide deck, we're happy to share it with you. We, we shared it on our website. Oh, okay, cool. We, we post all of our presentations on the website and we actually also record them. So we can go back and, and take a look. Um, obviously, um, your district um, has a lot of interest. So, and your presentation was great. It really shows how much you're, you are doing to try to uh, minimize uh, methane gas um, leakage and actually turn that into energy, which is super duper. So thank you very much, Tim and Angela. And we appreciate you, um, your presentation and you being here today and, and really educating us. Thank, thank you. And Anytime you we come back, we're happy to, to follow up. So, yeah, if people want to uh, talk number two, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The life of an earthworm. <laughs> All right. I'll see. I'll see you two tomorrow. Okay. All right. The, the sequel is never as good as the original. <laughs> All right. Um, nice presentation. I think now we're going to the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District. Jeff, did you want to do, who's introducing this one? Michael's going to. Oh, Michael, thank you. Go ahead. Okay, okay thank you. Um, I think everybody understands uh, that our wa local water supply is critical to our sustainability and our security as a, as a community. And in that context, we're fortunate to have uh, Dave Stoltz with us tonight to do a presentation. He's the, uh, the manager of the Monterey Peninsula Water Management District, has been for a long time, and he's an expert in our water supply is resiliency and how climate change is gonna affect it. And I've kind of looked over his presentation and it's, uh, it looks like a, a, he's gonna give us an update on, on exactly our current uh, situation in that area. So Dave, uh, thank you so much and take over. Great, thank you very much for having me. It's good to see everybody. Little known fact, in a previous life, I was an investment banker for public projects and I financed uh, the regional waste's uh, first materials recovery facility, or MRF, in the mid 90s. And that's uh, my claim to fame in the waste area. But uh, I'm mostly a water guy. I financed a lot of water and wastewater in that career and then shifted over in this direction. Um, I had my civil engineering degree was hydro systems, which means water systems, and environmental, which typically at the time meant wastewater. Um, so that that was my area, but I took a departure into the finance aspect of it rather than the engineering aspect of it, which was uh, very rewarding. So, uh, Agnes, are you going to run my presentation, or is Evan? Yeah, let me uh, let me share my screen right now. And while we're waiting, Michael's right in that I'm going to talk a little bit about where we are today, but also where we're going and what some of the vulnerabilities are. Um, and you guys can all see my screen, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Looks good. So 
hand in hand with climate change is um, trying to get an understanding of are we already in it? Are we at the front end? Um, so going to the next slide, I wanted to show you that, you know, because each year is just an imprint in the current time, it becomes more and more difficult for people to understand, are we in the beginning of climate change? Was it just a bad year? Is this a, you know, is this a bad year, last year a good year, and so forth? So just by looking at some of the data, um, I wanted to kind of show you uh, how things vary. We did a lot of this work back in 2015 during the, the most recent drought, um, but we're beginning to see the, the rumblings of uh, information that shows that we might be heading into another drought. This is called the drought monitor. Uh, this is the Western states. They actually cover the entire country, uh, typically run out of the University of Iowa or the University of Nebraska. Um, what you see here is brown is exceptional drought, which is worse than extreme. I always thought my kids were ex exceptional, but uh, I guess exceptional in this case means bad. Um, and then white means no uh, appearance of drought. And so you see California is very colorful. Um, going to the next slide, you can see today, 2021, um, January 11th, that there is no brown except at the very uh, Nevada and Arizona borderline area. And Monterey uh, County and the peninsula are basically in uh, moderate drought, which means it's a little too early to tell. Um, water years, we, we live in water years in the water business, which start October 1st and then September 30th. And so we're barely into the water year here in December. Um, you know, it's basically, uh, we've got data through the end of the first quarter. So it's a little early to worry, but when you compare it to one year ago on the right-hand side, there were no drought conditions except at the very northern part of the state up near the Klamath River uh, and so forth. So this is a marked difference uh, compared to one year ago. Uh, next slide. We in the water industry statewide, and this is just an example, uh, we constantly monitor reservoir conditions. Uh, the red line is, is typically the uh, historical average and so you can see already in the Central Valley, Trinity Lake, Lake Shasta, Lake Oroville, Folsom Lake uh, are, are below their historical averages. And then further south, uh, Pine Flat, Millerton, and San Luis are below their historical averages. And they rely on winter rains to refill. And so if we don't see a whole lot of activity in February and March, uh, we could have a problem. But we had an unseasonably wet April uh, in 2020. So what we're beginning to see is the traditional patterns. You know, remember you could almost predict that when the AT&T golf tournament took place, there'd be rain. Um, we're beginning to see that the traditional patterns don't long, any longer hold, but we still have, uh, so example, last winter, we had two full months of the winter season with no rain whatsoever, and we still ended up in a normal year. Um, so it's, uh, it's changing, the pattern is changing. Um, so it's, you, you can't necessarily draw from historical. Um, Nacimento and uh, San Antonio reservoirs are monitored in this site, just not shown on this graph, but the little dams on the Carmel River, like the Los Padres Dam, uh, is not monitored through this. Next slide, please. So this is some data that we um, utilized from the, the earlier drought, and this is from 2015. But I wanted to show you uh, kind of some stark reality. So the, the vertical uh, axis is annual precipitation in inches, horizontal is average temperature. And you can see that the, the blue, the light blue, is 105 year uh, plotting uh, 1895 to 2000. But the black dots were the 21st century, basically beginning in 2000 through uh, 2014. And this is the Sacramento Valley. Um, we use a lot of just California-wide data uh, for purposes of demonstration. 
the takeaway here is precipitation was still kind of all over the board, um, consistent with the historical randomness of highs and lows. But every one of the temperatures in the new 21st century in the Sacramento Valley exceeded the average. So we were obviously getting warmer in the Sacramento Valley. Going to the next slide, this is the San Joaquin Valley. Same pattern, precipitation was, you could consider normal because it was all over the page, up and down. But all but one of the years in the 2000s were above the historical average. Data like this doesn't lie. We are getting warmer. So the next slide shows uh, average temperatures in California through 2020. Um, we'd love it here on the peninsula if, in fact, uh, we were at that mean of 73.7 degrees on average, which we're not. But what you can see is a general up trend from the mid-70s, um, kind of ignoring the 1966 and 67 spikes. Um, but it does appear that we're in the beginnings of an uptrend. So even though August 2020 in California was the warmest in 100 years, it could be the coolest for the next 100 years. Next slide. So looking a little bit at sea level rise, um, not all studies use the same uh, uh, assumptions. And this one, this is 55 inches of sea level rise. And what you're looking at here is the, the blue line or the blue, the, the light blue and the dark blue line are the areas of uh, inundation due to sea level rise. So with 55 inches, so, you know, that's about, uh, boy, it was a meter and a half or whatever, but, you know, just under five feet. Um, you can see that our, you know, the, the beach area of Carmel, and you've probably seen in other graphics, relatively unaffected, um, you know, may, and that's basically because of the, the height of the, you know, the natural seawall behind the beach, uh, a little bit more of an import right there at the terminus of Ocean Ave. But, but the big issue for us is the city of Monterey and the potential for inundation at Lake El Estero and the Carmel River State Beach, the lagoon, which you can see uh, pushes way in. And if you were to enlarge this, you would see that the, the lagoon now abuts the uh, southernly most corner of the mission at this point. So Mission Ranch is underwater. Uh, many homes are underwater. But when you look at how the scientists do this, there's kind of two schools of thought. Um, one is that with sea level rise, the dune formation and the dune profile would remain the same. So sand production just rises. And so the, the, the lagoon barrier, you know, the beach or the berm that we have at the state beach, um, might rise with sea level rise. And so this would be an aberrant lagoon in that um, you would still have bre breaching issues. But if you did have uh, a successful normal rainy season, the inundation space would, would follow that, um, that blue area. And so the flood risk you know, normally where you see the sandbags at the end of the cul-de-sacs down there by the lagoon. Well, now we're actually up deep into the homes and the blocks. And you're, as I mentioned, you're all the way up to the, the uh, mission at that point. The issues in Monterey are a little bit different. We'll talk about those here on the next chart. So now this is 62 inches of sea level rise. Uh, you may have seen this graphic in the weekly in December uh, as the city of Monterey in their planning was looking at uh, choices of either erecting a seawall to protect uh, this area, which would be, I think they were talking about a 12 foot seawall. So you would lose your windows on the bay and your, your uh, beautiful vistas or a natural um, 
recession of the shoreline and allowing houses to become uh, torn down and inundated and so forth. So what you see is that um, Lake El Estero becomes a new recreational harbor. Suggested here are um, Third Street getting bridges across and Fremont Street getting a bridge across. Del Monte Avenue becomes uh, a dead end at either side of this new bay. And what's interesting here is for those of you who, um, and Carrie, I don't know who sits on the Monterey one. Oh, it's, it's uh, who's on, oh, you guys aren't caught anyway. So for Monterey's purposes, the interceptor for the wastewater plant basically follows Del Monte Avenue. So it's, you know, there are infrastructure issues for us in that the largest pipe carrying wastewater flows to the north would be also inundated here. And the outfall from Monterey One Water's wastewater treatment plant, um, which is up in North Marina, is about 100 yards from the uh, shoreline. And it will also would become inundated. So we have major infrastructure issues relative to existing backbone pipe systems. Uh, next slide. So the purple or maroon bars are average rainfall in a historical record over 90 years. Um, it's, I think it's get it coming up on 98 years worth of data. And then the blue bars are uh, the current water year actual. So we received no rain in October, little over half an inch in November, little under half an inch in December, and almost the same little over half an inch in January. So we're at an inch and a half total through uh, three and a half months of the, the water year, the rainy season, um, that does not bode well. So next chart. Now ignore the bottom uh, nomenclature that says 2014 through 15. What those really should say is just October, November, December, January, because this is the 90 plus year of historical record and what we do is we take all the data that there is and we create these black lines based on a distribution of all those 90 plus years of data. And we say, you know, the top 12 and a half percent of years of extreme rainfall would be extremely wet. The next 12 and a half percent is wet. Next 12 and a half percent is above normal. The next 25 percent is normal. And then 12.5% below normal, 12.5% dry, 12.5% critically dry. So you just take the huge data set, you break it up like that, and you see where these breakpoints are. So 1998 was the highest rainfall total on record. And you can see, you know, it was beyond extremely wet. I mean, it was significant. Our average rainfall here is just about 22 inches. And 1998 was more than double that. 1924 was our lowest rainfall total on record. And what you can see, the little green dotted line at the very bottom through the first uh, three data points, October, November, and December, is following that red line. So as we sit today, we are at the same place as the lowest rainfall total on record. It's early. February could be different. March could be different. Uh, April could be different, but it's telling us that we're heading in a direction. Um, next slide. This is the same type of analysis, but based on unimpaired stream flow. So this is water flowing uh, through the Carmel River as recorded at San Clemente Dam site, now that the, the dam itself is gone. Um, the previous one you can tell was from 1922. So that's where um, that data record is. This one goes back all the way to 1902. So this is, you know, basically 118 years worth of record. And we are tracking uh, the bottom end of the scale. So we look at this and, you know, we we're always concerned for our current year, but we're also concerned as to whether this is a you know, harbinger of things to come. And in fact, we're beginning to be in a, a, a low cycle. The next chart is our 10 worst first three months. And 
you can see I've added water year 2021, which we're down at that bottom elbow following the worst year possible. But what is interesting, or at least interesting to me is many of these, all 10 of these were pretty low. They were, you know, no better than two and a half inches at the end of December. Yet one, two, three, four, five, six ended up uh, five of them, it looks like, ended up could be below normal or normal. So again, it's very early in our, our process, but you can have a bad start and um, finish, finish strong, finish good. Uh, so moving on, so let's take a look at some of the local impacts of climate change. And I'm gonna just concentrate on the three major water supply uh, potentials. So the desalination plant, which of course is still kind of a dream, um, because it has not received its coastal development permit. Uh, they pulled their application back and we don't know what their plan is for reapplying. But there are five slant well sites with seven slant wells. And a slant well is basically a well that's drilled away from the shore on a 19 degree uh, angle towards the ocean. So it's kind of following the, the short, the, uh, the sand surface at a uh, similar angle and heading out towards the ocean. So of these five sites for seven slant wells, they are on the inland side of the barrier dunes uh, up in North Marina. The scientists have said that you can expect um, sea level rise anywhere from a meter and a half to two meters but that the profile of the sand dunes is very likely to remain the same. So that goes back to my point about uh, Carmel River State Beach, that if you raise everything that has the same characteristics, then um, in that case, in the river, it matters because there's water on the other side. Here, the biggest uh, threats to the sand, uh, to the slant wells is actually burial due to prevailing winds. And the, the way that prevailing winds move sand is typically through what are called blowouts. And there are trough blowouts and saucer blowouts. And so trough blowouts are typically, uh, as you can see, cuts that uh, go windward towards the ocean. And so as the wind comes through there and the, vegetarian, uh, the vegetation is stripped, it then allows the sand to move forward and it creates a lobe that then marches with the wind inland towards the slant well sites. The saucer blowouts are more like bowls, typically either in an existing dune or behind an, an existing dune. But the studies show that beginning anywhere from 2040 to 2060, uh, dune erosion and storm-related erosion could begin to um, bury all of the slant wellhead sites. Um, the Coastal Commission, of course, is concerned that to protect them, you'd have to harden uh, the barriers, put up uh, sand fencing or permanent uh, concrete barriers or relocate or so forth. So they have grave concerns. Um, our concerns are more with uh, shoreline erosion uh, because if, if the shoreline erodes to the wellheads, then you've lost the functionality and you're gonna to have to move the wellheads further back at, at huge expense to the ratepayers. Uh, next slide. For Pure Water Monterey, which is a water recycling project that uh, advanced purifies water and delivers it for human potable use, um, you know, there's four sources and each source is impacted differently by climate warming and drought. What we learned in the mid 2000s, you know, the 2013, 14, 15, 16 drought was that the growers, the growers don't really grow less produce. They tended to shift their source. So instead of as recycled water sources went down, they pumped more. It's unclear whether that will be able to continue under the uh, statewide stigma or uh, uh, the Groundwater uh, Sustainable Groundwater Management Act, but they did. They they tended to produce just as much as they had produced before, and so the vulnerabilities in a warmer climate are really 
uh, obviously stormwater. If you have less rain, you're gonna have less stormwater. For pure water Monterey, the stormwater component is very limited and so is not thought to have much of an impact. Wastewater, you may irrigate your, ho your home less, but unless you're taking permanent conservation uh, actions, your wastewater flow generally is unaffected. So if there is voluntary conservation because we're in drought or in a, a climate change, then maybe people's behavior will change or if technology advances that we can get to even lower flow toilets or shower heads or what have you, then your wastewater would be affected. But generally speaking, wastewater is not that affected by warmer temperatures um, because you know, obviously irrigation doesn't go down your drain. Um, agricultural water, so this is agricultural return flows. That's one of the sources. Um, we get it from two places. One's called the Blanco drain, which drains about 6,800 acres just north of the Salinas River. And the other is called a, the Reclamation Ditch, which, um, you know, ditch or drain, basically what's happening is most of the farmer's fields in that area are have uh, drainage tiles. So you apply irrigation water, it goes through the root zone and it's collected in tiles and then it is actually drained out to these ditches or drains rather than um, proceed into the groundwater. So what we learned during the last drought is this water doesn't actually um, go away because they tend to find, as I mentioned, you know, find other sources uh, by increasing pumping. But if the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act uh, requirements hold true, they might not be able to continue to pump as much. So we're, you know, we're concerned about that impact. And then finally, produce wash water. About a billion gallons a year is used to bag lettuce. And I know, you know, children today think lettuce is actually naturally grown in bags and delivered to your grocery store. Um, but, you know, this was invented here. It allowed the margins for produce to go through the roof. Um, and as I said, it's a, a billion gallons a year of water that has no additional beneficial use until we put pure water Monterey into effect. So, even if these waters are affected by uh, a general warming of our climate, the thing that has the water supply protected is we have a right of first refusal. So we need about 4,000 4, acre feet a year. Uh, an acre foot is basically a, a football field covered with a foot of water on it. And, it, and we need that 4,000 acre feet to produce 3,500 acre feet of pure, fresh, potable water. Um, all of the sources that are available to the project uh, accumulate to over 8,500 acre feet. And so by having that right of first refusal, we don't believe that the uh, base project for Pure Water Monterey would be affected by climate change or uh, long-term extended drought. Next slide. So the third piece of the three-legged stool in terms of water supply is what's called aquifer storage and recovery. The concept is in winter months when there's plenty of water on the Carmel River, you take it and you deliver it to the seaside basin, put it in the ground, and then begin to build up a bank. And so what this graphic shows you, the blue, you can ignore the green at the bottom. That cycling is basically pure water Monterey water going in the ground and coming out of the ground on a steady basis year in and year out. But the blue represents, think of it as a reservoir behind the dam, but there's no dam. So this is in the ground. And so each uptick in the blue is taking river water and injecting it into the ground, followed by the next year, putting it in the ground. And so on the upslopes, those are years that could be wet years when it's a real steep and high increase, or they could be normal years when it's a, a, a moderate increase. But the normal to wet years increase the supply in the ground, and then the below normal and drought years, or critically dry and dry years, are the downslopes um, as a result of being unable to charge 
the, the basin and at the same time using some of the water uh, as, a, as a supply source. So you're taking water out of the ground with no means to replace it. And so what you see in this uh, history here, this is a, uh, I think it's a 25 year history. We had 21 years worth of data and then we just repeat it again. What you see is you're building up a big source of supply in the ground. And then you hit a point in this case, roughly around October of uh, 1933 in this example, and you have five drought years in a row and you go into decline again. But even at the end of the drought, you know, you could even call this a six to seven year drought because it, you know, it's still in decline. There's still a lot of water in the ground. Our vulnerability is that if rainfall decreases due to warming, and that becomes the norm, then you could take that first upslope and you reduce it by a third. And then if there are more severe droughts or uh, longer droughts, then the downslopes actually uh, become more pronounced. And so you could end up in this cycle at roughly half the water that you end up with in this example uh, up there at the 20,000 acre foot mark. If you're at 10,000, what that means is your buffer, your ability to um, supplement the water supply on a year in year out basis goes away. And so, you know, we believe that we're vulnerable to climate change. We believe that we're drought proof if, if normal conditions persist. And as I said, this data set was all based on normal conditions. And we show that you build up a supply. Yes, you can endure a five to six, seven year drought. And then you go back to building up supply. So the big concern as a water planner is not uh, drought or an extended drought. It's really a change to what is normal, a new normal. And so that's one of the things we're looking towards when you rely on storage. Um, you are susceptible to uh, systemic changes in the amount of rain uh, and, and temperature. That being said, a lot of the proponents for desalination will tell you, well, that ocean out there is drought proof. And I would grant you it is, it really is. But in the next 50 years, it's, pretty clear that we don't actually need desal, that we have existing resources that will carry us certainly for 30 years. Um, so, you know, it remains to be seen whether we end up with a desal plant, a desalination plant or not, or if we expand uh, advanced purified recycled water. But either way, I think that the impact on water supply planning for the peninsula is still off in the future. Um, even if we are at the front end of a long-term climate change, uh, I believe we've got several decades to uh, address what it means to our water supply. And with that, I will take any questions. Questions? Questions for Dave? It's Lynette here, Yeah. <laughs> Um, Dave, thank you uh, for the presentation. I must admit that I was a little surprised to hear your um, level of reassurance um, about our water supply. I had not expected to hear that with as much kind of breadth and scope as you gave. Having said that, um, your last remarks were about for several decades. Given the challenge and the regulatory environment and expecting that to increase probably rather than decrease, and that it takes not only long to get um, regulatory approval, but also then to do implementation, what is your recommendation for how people should think about what level of urgency should we feel in respect of water supply? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, you know, I wanna keep with the reassuring tone of it. it's not urgent, 
yet. You know, in California, it's it's 10 to 15 years to get a project built. And so, you know, we are afforded the luxury, you know, if, if the desalination project gets built as planned right now, um, we're probably good for 50, 50, five, zero years. Um, and that's a big burden to put on current ratepayers because that means there aren't future ratepayers coming online who can dilute the cost. But as I mentioned, you know, the ocean looks pretty promising as drought proof. Um, it, it's always good to be one of the first straws into the ocean. Um, you know, because if the entire world relied on the oceans, you know, that's just another uh, place uh, that we can screw up further, which, you know, I think we're a little concerned about. But, you know, where we're at today, we, you know, since the, the 2013 to 16 drought, we know that temperatures are rising and are permanent. In our Mediterranean climate of 22 inches of rain a year, and, and we're always kind of the, the poor stepchild every time an atmospheric river comes in and we're watching it come in from the, you know, the southwest portion of the Pacific. Big Sur gets three times as much rain as we get. The other side of Chews Ridge, um, it's just, it's amazing. And then, of course, Santa Cruz. We'll watch these things go and we'll get two inches of rain in Santa Cruz or the mountains up, you know, near Scotts Valley and, and behind. Um, they'll get 12 inches. And so we've, you know, always been kind of the poor, uh, poorly located geographically uh, source, uh, source of rain or uh, sink for rain. And so it, it troubles me because if we do see a, um, a permanent change in rainfall going from 22 inches to even 18 inches a year, that's actually a significant percentage. And the way our current supply works, you know, our reliance on the Carmel River has primarily been, uh, you know, 60 to 70% of all our water. The aquifer beneath the Carmel River, because we're not really taking any water from the surface of the Carmel River. We haven't done that since about 2002. It's all from wells drilled under the river, taking river water that's percolated underground. That reservoir, when full, is only about a three-year supply. So I would tell you that, that there's some urgency if we see warming temperatures and a permanent decline in rain, except that we're moving away from the Carmel River as a primary source of supply. So it's moving from the point of, you know, two thirds of our total to less than a third of our total. So that kind of tempers it a little bit. Um, so it's the other new sources of supply that need to be looked at for their drought resilience or their climate change resilience. And, you know, I, I, I'm pretty strongly believing that both Pure Water Monterey expansion and the desalination plant both provide some drought protection, uh, both due to the way they're designed and what their source waters are and the legal access to the waters having some priority over others. That means somebody else is gonna struggle before we struggle, but yeah. More questions, Michael? Uh, Dave, is there, are there strong correlations between rising temperatures and droughts in our area, or is that more a condition of the, of the Pacific? I mean, there's, you know, you hear a lot about El Nino and yeah. La Nina situations. And so I'm just curious what you're, what you can, you know, tell us about that. Yeah, no, it, and I, th I think you've put your finger on it. So we had a, a, a pretty significant El Nino during the drought previously. Uh, you may have heard it referred to as the blob. Um, there was another great term that one of the Stanford uh, meteorologists named it. Um, and in fact, the, the temperatures in Monterey Bay were anywhere from two to three degrees warmer during that period than historical averages. And uh, you weren't getting the upwelling of the cool water from below to, that comes up to the surface and also brings a lot of 
uh, food, you know, benthic matter for uh, fish to eat. So that drought was more correlated to the oceanographic conditions than the temperature conditions. And if you remember the two charts that I showed earlier for the San Joaquin and the Sacramento, where precipitation was on the vertical and temperature on the horizontal, you would see that all of the temperatures in the 2000s were above average, but rainfall was still all over the board. And so we continue to see that, you know, it's, that was only a, you know, 14 or 15 year data set. And so we don't really, you know, have good correlation yet, but that's the thing we're most interested in, which is if we have a, a permanent rise in ambient temperature, what does that do to rainfall? But as of right now, the data is showing it's not fully correlated. Yeah, Anyas, I think you can you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I remember from some months ago that we were expecting to see more variability in, in our rainfall in the area, but a slight uptick. So um, we're not we're expecting warmer temperatures, but slightly warmer rain if more sporadic. Right, I think that's what the California climate assessment says. More more intense storms, but not necessarily more or less rain. That seems to not be. That's exactly right, Anya. Right. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, it's you got to pick your meteorologist, but I think the current majority are winning with that argument that there will be more intense which has other ramifications. I mean, one of our concerns right now this winter is as a result of the fires, the entire watershed up there, uh, there are hillsides that are completely denuded from the fires. And if we had intense rains, we're more concerned about sediment flows into the river and what that does to both habitat uh, and water quality. Um, so in a, in a little bit, of a regard, we're happy we haven't had as much uh, rain, at least in an intense form. But you know, a long kind of mild rain for an extended period of time would be really nice. But we're not seeing it. More questions. Um, I have a short question, Dave. Uh, what's do you know the status of the large infrastructure pipeline that's being constructed to facilitate water from the Carmel River back to the Monterey side of the peninsula and vice versa? Yeah, yeah, it's complete and it's in use. Um, the first year it came online was, uh, oh, I think in 2018 for a partial season. Uh, 2019 worked pretty well, and we made uh, working with Cal Am, we've made uh, some efforts to really kind of finesse it. And yet we don't have any rain yet to test it out. So our season, so it's a bi-directional pipeline. Um, prior to a desal plant or anything in the uh, kind of in the north part of the service area, all the system was designed to work from south to north. We we're moving Carmel River water down the valley, around the Horn, to Monterey, and then it kind of bumped into what we call a, a hydraulic barrier, uh, right about old, uh, old Monterey, kind of the Naval Postgraduate School, where it was hard to push any water further north, and it was impossible to push any water from the north further south. And so that pipeline uh, took care of that hydraulic barrier. Um, so in, in periods where we're pulling pure water Monterey water out of the ground and when and if there's a uh, desalination plant or pure water Monterey expansion, we need to move water from north to south. And that's why that pipeline was put into place uh, primarily because otherwise you're pushing water through a distribution system. And imagine Carmel's old, you know, creaky pipes. If you tried to push water at very high pressure through Carmel, to try to get it to Pacific Grove, you would be creating so many leaks and uh, blown, you know, we like to laugh, you'd be uh, blowing the shower heads off of people's homes because you're putting too much pressure in the local distribution system. It wouldn't really happen like that, but distribution systems with all those connections aren't designed to take, to convey water long distances to other places where you need high pressure. 
So that pipeline was built, it works, but in the winter, it was designed to reverse flow and take the Carmel River water and bring it around uh, near Forest uh, Lake, uh, the old Forest Lake Reservoir in Pebble Beach, and then push it through Pacific Grove and up into Monterey and over to Seaside. And it, it's working, it's working. So we've got two paths now to move water to Seaside, that pipeline, and then there's a, a smaller pipeline that goes up the access way to Tehama, and then up over the hill through Montera and drops down uh, to near uh, 218 and Delray Oaks. Thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, I was just wondering uh, that I'm assuming your um, future projections for water supply include uh, potential development that might happen in our local cities. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on what beyond the standard of building uh, code requirements for water conservation, what the uh, Monterey Peninsula Water Management District encourages people to do and developers to do on private property to help sort of our, our, our outlook. Yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting, Agnes, because, um, you know, during the drought, the state passed a bunch of legislation, one of which was uh, Muella, which is a model, uh, you know, it's a, a landscape irrigation ordinance. And basically they said, if you don't pass a local ordinance that looks like this, then you'll be subject to state regulation. So we passed the ordinance on behalf of all the jurisdictions on the peninsula and the unincorporated county. The county then promised that they would pass an ordinance countywide that mimicked ours. Uh, they have since not done that. And nobody enforces it, you know, because that's one of those things where even building inspectors, when you get your certificate of occupancy, they're not really looking at your landscape. And your landscape's typically not even in when they uh, kind of give final approval to a project. But that's one of the biggest uh, uses of water, you know, even on, you know, small Carmel lots. And so there have been regulations, uh, you know, we've done quite a bit on our own that the rest of the state's caught up to. So we don't have anything new on our books that we're planning for inside the home. Um, but the most recent one was outside the home. And as I said, it's, it's poorly enforced. Uh, there's some impact, but, you know, that's really where you're gonna get the most, most bang for your buck. And what happens too, as you can well imagine, the peak usage has always been July and August. Hottest months, greatest irrigation need. And we've worked really hard and you can actually see it in the graphics in the last 15 years, we've reduced the size of those peaks. And so what that, what that does is it makes your water system uh, safer from the, from the peak demand forecast uh, standpoint. You know, water systems have to have excess capacity to meet the peak. So car week comes, uh, you know, everyone is using water. And so you have to have additional supply. And so you have to build your system bigger to meet the peaks. And, and that's part of uh, California code. Um, so what we're seeing is as, as the peaks define, then the amount of water supply that you have to build can be lower. And so I think that, you know, with changes in regulation and changes in practice, we will have less stress on the need to uh, build additional water supply simply to meet peak demands. But the, you know, the other issue for the peninsula is there, you know, unlike Fort Ord, there's not a whole lot of raw land. So even though we've set aside in all of our demand forecasts, uh, you know, about 1,200 acre feet for future growth, that growth cannot happen very quickly. There's not vast tracts of land. And so it's gonna be very uh, slow to develop the, the market absorption rate for new housing in places like Carmel, Carmel Valley, um, 
you know, you look at the general plan for the county, Carmel Valley doesn't have much to go. And if the Carmel, uh, you know, the Kenyatta Villages Project, uh, Carmel Development Corp, you know, Alan, uh, anyway, I, I digress, but if that gets built, there's not gonna be a whole lot of room for additional housing in the valley. And so it's all infill, it's all conversion to mixed use. It's, um, and so it's gonna happen very slowly. And so that gives you the, the privilege as a, as a water planner to kind of look at where you've gone in three to four years and to see what your growth rate looks like. So you can make more measured decisions about how quickly you need to build the next water supply project. And so that's not gonna be driven by climate. That's not gonna be driven by temperature. It's gonna be driven by builders, uh, ability to get things built in this constrained environment and, and frankly, planning department's ability to process. Uh, City of Seaside had a uh, staff member said, if you gave me 300 acre feet of new water, I could use that in a heartbeat. And I had to you know, chuckle a little bit because they don't have a staff in, City, in Seaside to process anything. They have, they have difficulties year in and year out in getting you know, seven or eight projects approved. So. Um, you know, there's other constraints to our need for water. Okay. Well, thank you, Dave. You gonna let me go? That's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you go. Oh, I see Libby okay, has her hand up. Uh, one more question, Libby. Where are we can trying to hear Libby? Can't hear you, Libby. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, my, uh, uh, we we kind of need to get going. Laura, do you have a quick question? Can't hear Laura either. Okay. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Michael, for arranging that. Why don't we move on to the next thing on our agenda, which is the discussion or acceptance of the community wildfire preparedness hazard and asset sheet. So first let me say, I don't know, John, if you wanna make some remarks, but let me say um, thank you for, for putting in this effort and for combining the two presentations and all of that. I, uh, my initial glance is that this looks great um, do you have anything, any questions for us, John, that you would like to help you with? Or would you like us to just make comments? Um, what would you like? Um, I don't know. Well, basically, these are the same two presentations we went over before. They've just been combined to eliminate any redundancy. So I, I don't think there's anything new that's there. A few things have been uh, taken out because they were repetitive. Okay, I would make, um, before we open it up sort of for, uh, I guess for general comments, John, before I forget, um, you know, one of the things on the city council's docket of items is uh, Chip announced a couple of months ago that we were gonna be renegotiating the fire services contract. And um, I'm not sure that really Carrie and I should be giving input from this committee into what we might want to see in the fire services contract that this, the services of the city receives, but you might be the appropriate person to do that. So why don't um, I'll take it on myself to talk to Chip and figure out how this committee can sort of get some recommendations into that process since we are on the verge of starting that process. Sure, would be happy to. It's, uh, there's a number of things that would be good for the city right. to follow up with uh, whoever ends up with the contract. That's a good point, Jeff. So um, I'm sure you, know, you, you and I yeah. could pass this report along to Chip as well. So 
Yeah, I, uh, one thing I was thinking about, John, I don't know if you would want to do this. It may be too much time for you. Um, yeah, it's probably it's probably not the right thing. I was going to say, you know, there are going to be there will be individual serving on that, just like this committee. I expect there to be private, you know, I expect there to be the members of the public serving on that committee too, and mm -hmm. that's probably a little bit more than just presenting uh, this sort of report to them, but just you know, something to think about, I guess. Any comments on John's uh, excellent work? Looks great to me. See, I see lots of thumbs up. So mm -hmm. thank you, John. Thank you. And why don't we move on to the next one. Um, for the summary sheet for the Beach Bluff Coastal Armoring Public Infrastructure and Private Property Sheet. Um, a, a little bit of a, um, I asked Scott to sort of lead us through this. I think that there might be a number of elements of discussion here. So I hope everyone has had a little bit of a chance to look at it. I know when Scott and I were reviewing this um, last week, we had a number of sort of questions come up that we weren't so sure about the answers or we didn't want to make answer assumptions for the whole committee. So I have some of those things and Scott probably has some of those things and maybe we should just sort of go through it. Scott, how did you want to do this? Yeah, I think that would be good. Um, and definitely want to get a discussion around some of these points because there were, as Jeff mentioned, some uh, some questions. I think what maybe I'd suggest is if we could just put it up. Um, I might make a few comments, add a little color around the bullets, and maybe we could go through section by section uh, or just see how it goes. I, I can pace it based upon the type of uh, input coming in. But if, uh, I don't know, I guess I could put it up or let's see. Yeah, I can, I'll, I'll share. Sorry, I was getting ready to ask you on this, but it makes more sense for me to do it. I can, if you can't see, I might be able to share it from my iPad. I can share it from, I can share the, the PDF. Yeah, could you go ahead and just put it up, please? Thank you. I just realized I have two computers and I have my uh, video call on the, computer without my file, so <laughs> appreciate the help. Okay. Yeah, maybe just an opening comment. Um, there's one uh, source that I thought was uh, quite interesting that we may have been mentioned in an earlier meeting, uh, but uh, we didn't, as a committee, see it together. I actually listened in on it. It was this uh, workshop that was put on by the California Coastal Commission and uh, local governments, and they've been work, look, working together, collaborating for for several years on topics related to um, sea level rise planning in an LCP context. And this was, I thought, a really good, um, had a lot of insights for me, at least going listening to that. So um, that is in the bottom of the references. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, so that was one of the things that probably influenced maybe more than uh, other uh, sources I look to, to uh, for this draft. All right, um, so I think what I'll do is uh, maybe just start with this first uh, section here, the general comments and outlook. I think I'll just go through these four bullet points and then pause and see if there's uh, questions. Um, I would say that this first bullet um, may be, um, you know, just as much as any kind of, for me, gives an essence as to the larger uh, question that we face here, which is that um, uh, we, this topic um, is not widely understood in terms of uh, how much climate change is going to impact our coastal um, infrastructure and and in a number of not just infrastructure but property and the beach, et cetera. So it's it's going to have a lot of impact and it's going to be quite substantial over the years. Also, the potential um, solutions are really quite complex. The more I learned about it, the more I realized there's a lot of complexity here when you start thinking about um, the varying, you know, you have natural forces with varying impacts, you have fiscal impacts, you have um, legal and, um, you know, coastal commission versus uh, local jurisdiction. You know, there's just a lot of variables in there, uh, probably some phasing in terms of what you do when. So that one kind of encapsulate for me, 
encapsulates for me kind of the broader um, situation for, for Carmel. Um, as you most of you are aware, that nearly the entire um, you know coastline is armored uh, uh, south of, of uh, Ocean Avenue, and um, if you when you listen to the experts, it's you know generally uh, stated that the there's secondary impacts to that type of armoring um, in terms of um, uh, uh, loss of um, a beach aesthetics, ecology, and also escalating uh, maintenance costs. So uh, that's uh, uh, one condition we have with the decisions we've made in the past about uh, the coast. Um, coastal erosion um, and storm events are, you know, already having an, uh, a threat. They already pose a threat, and we've experienced that certainly quite acutely in uh, 82, 83. And uh, climate change uh, and sea level rise is going to uh, dramatically increase that threat. Um, longer term, um, the degree to which uh, the city um, should or, or even can um, forestall these natural processes driven, driven by climate change is uh, uh, not understood. So I think I'll pause there. That's, that's quite a bit, um, maybe in four bullets, but it was the attempt to kind of just provide a general context or uh, uh, you know, comments around the situation and the outlook. So I'll give it a second, see if there's anyone wants to comment on that. We can always come back to these things at the end, but uh, I'll pause for so, a second here. So Scott, do you feel like there is some controversy here um, that we need to tease out or um, is that? Uh, do I don't, yeah, I would say in this, no. Uh, I think there might be some I'm surprised a little bit or just on a, again it's this issue of awareness so it's some education that maybe is needed i don't i certainly didn't intend for anything in here to be um you know creating tension or conflict uh, that i see i think when we start talking about solutions yes potentially okay. uh, that's not what this summary will be proposing um but uh i think in terms of the general comments and outlook i'm hoping it's fact-based it's mm -hmm. it's on you know credible kind of opinion and science there's a little bit of judgment for example in terms of what's the impact of armory um but right. again i tried to stick with what the experts generally are saying there so okay thank you i think michael has a question yeah all right well i it's just kind of a comment it seems to me there has been a lot of work done on sea level rise i mean i know myself i did projection maps based upon uh you know what what the um, IPPC was determining. Basically, it's you know what they're predicting is about a meter and a half, and you heard that in, in Dave's presentation too. Mm -hmm. so that, that can be math, and I just was wondering if the uh, we want to include that type of data in some of these summaries we're going to present. I think it would, I, I totally agree. It's a really complex issue, and there's a lot of unknowns, particularly when it comes to erosion. Uh, mm -hmm. And they're having, you know, that's been a real complex thing to study. And, uh, but it may help people understand what the potential and if they see a graphic, you know, what sea level rise is predicted to be. And yeah. it, seems like, it seems like we're on a pretty certain path here. Right. Uh, you know, the, what, you know, the, the way the temperatures are rising and sea level rise mm -hmm. has a long, uh, curvature timeline you know even if you even if we stopped all the greenhouse gas emissions today it would still be years before we ever saw you know the the rise of sea level mm -hmm. decline so i just think it would be helpful if we could add some some uh, graphics to some of these uh, reports mm -hmm. these summaries we're going to present to the city yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, I thought about, I think I started doing some of that and I ended up taking it out. I, um, not for a strong reason other than just trying to, to simplify it a little bit, but I, I think that's a good point. There is some solid data too about this. It is, it, to your point, I think both our points, it is complex to understand in terms of the, uh, the episodic nature of these things and uh, what it really means for the, the bluff itself for the seawalls, for the infrastructure, those things, it's a very noisy data. So you can put a nice smooth, uh, you know, sea level rise 
graph, but you still have to make some assumptions or judgment about what it means with these episodic events and how you plan and all that. So it's still a tough one, I think, to interpret. Um, Carrie, uh, may I? It's Lynette. Um, this is a, a more general comment that um, brings itself to the forefront because of Scott's work here, and that is, I'm, I'm not sure in these whether we need to go to that level of visuals and graphs and so on, because are we not going to have in whatever document these eventually end up with, are these not going to be followed by the actual deck of the presentation so that those kinds of details are included? Because otherwise, it's impossible to summarize any of these presentations. They've all been so rich with data. And, and so I, I find myself wondering exactly what is the purpose and to what degree do we want to get to the level of specifics that would be generated by inclu including graphs and, and pictures and so on. Well, I think that you know my 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 thoughts were that when we produce a report, you know, at the beginning, like the first five or ten or fifteen or however many pages, i.e., however many hours of Anya's time we have, we would we, you know we would produce some sort you know like this is where we got all of our data from, you know, and there's there's data that comes from the climate change assessment which we talked about you know before COVID and all that about temperature rise and rainfall variability and sea level rise and all that. And then there's data, which I think Scott is gonna talk about in a few minutes, that is about what the actual physical impacts on our, on our, our sandy areas, our, our water in our sandy areas are gonna be. Does that answer your question, Lynette? Well, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe we're cross-talking a little bit. I feel like what Scott did is an excellent summary of those of, of what we heard and the extent to which we need or want more specifics and a deeper dive into data should come from either looking at those presentations <clears throat> or some other document because if we if we get too detailed in these, then they don't become summaries. They become something else. So let's go. Um, let's go. Let's let's spend another ten minutes on this, Lynette, because I think that um, based on the conversations that I had with Scott, I think we're going to have this exact conversation in a few minutes as we get a little bit further down this document. Okay. So let me ask. So let's let's move on a tiny bit, and then we'll circle back. Yeah, that sounds good. So maybe we could uh, uh, scroll down, we'll take a look at the identified issues. And, yeah, uh, I just keep going. Yep, yeah, okay. So I think the identified issues section, um, I just stepped through them and I would say, if so, I'll try and watch if a hand goes up, we can kind of pause on them. Uh, and and talk about if uh, there's other inputs um, as we go here. So um, first one, uh, the frequency and duration of beach inundation and wave attack um, is is increasing, and uh, the impacts of armory um, on the beach sand loss as well as seasonal migration of sand on and offshore is has not been investigated. So you know, Carmel's a Bit unique as we know with kind of a closed system as far as the sand goes there are studies that i come across talking more about where there's a littoral zone of of um up and down the coast but carmel's kind of unique and so that's it's obviously a very prized asset in carmel but we don't really know too much about that sand movement in terms of how it's being impacted by the armory i'll pause there and see if there's anyone wants to jump in if I don't see a hand, I'm gonna keep going, okay. Um, the natural uh, erosion processes uh, along the mostly unarmored North Dunes uh, uh, will accelerate. And if the, the bluff retreat is allowed with our current situation, um, without having any armory there, you would um, 
uh, see the beach migrate inland, and then there would be impacts uh, on, of course, the uh, the dune habitat and the recreation area. So that's a place where you don't have armory, and natural processes would allow the uh, would push the beach in, in, in there. Carrie, do you have a question that you want to uh, say now, or do you want what? Well, um, in, in regards to that sentence, um, the first part of the sentence is that, you know, I feel comfortable with the natural erosion process, um, uh, how it's gonna affect the unarmored dunes. The, the second part of the sentence, while at the same time reducing dune habitat and recreation above, I don't think we're, I'm not comfortable with how much that's gonna be impacted. Because, uh, which um, later, which, um, which in the recommendations, it, uh, it, it relates to the recommendations that we may make. So uh, that's where uh, on this sentence, I'm not sure I'm, I'm comfortable because we're, we're not sure what, how big of an impact it's gonna to be to that particular part of the beach. Yeah, that's something I wrestle with quite a bit, by the way. I mean, generally how, I don't wanna to lead too far beyond what, trying to stick with the facts. Right. Um, they are quite clear, I'd say the experts about, you know, the retreat. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you're allowing natural erosion to continue, there's gonna be some retreat. So I kind of ran with that in terms of uh, what the implications would be above that particular area but so, you know i also don't want to make it hyperbolic or somehow inconsistent with what is likely to happen given our time scale so i think your point is a good one yeah so i would be more comfortable with just a period after for the beach to migrate inland period mm -hmm. as a suggestion how about um how about replacing the word while with the word possibly okay to, to leave the uh, to leave the issue there mm -hmm. because you know, because I think it's an issue, you know I think it's an issue that um, the intensity is greater than zero. Mm -hmm. I mean it might be close to zero mm -hmm. and it might be you know tens of yards, but I do think it's greater than zero. Mm -hmm. So perhaps we could uh, compromise and use the word possibly and then and then leave that um, be sort of clear maybe in the section that we're gonna talk about in a minute, when Scott talks about the coastal engineer, we could sort of flag, mm -hmm. we could flag that as, you know, we could be more more precise about the coastal engineering impacts or issues to be explored. So um, I um, I think that uh, suggestion at change in wording is fine. Okay, okay. okay. I, and maybe just one other overlay on that. It, it, it was my, uh, hope to be, not hope to be, but I, my aim was to be not mincing words and to be blunt with, because there, there are some serious things here. And mm -hmm. if, sometimes we, I hear people speak around things they don't mm -hmm. want to talk about because it's, it's unsure or on, you know, it could be a sensitive topic. But I think where we have the facts and the longer term trend is there, um, I felt like it was very important just to put it out there plainly and to be somewhat blunt, not again, inconsistent with the, the data. So I kind of appreciate where we put that I, and and I'm comfortable with that wording on that one here. But you will see that throughout. I attempted to be pretty blunt on these, even though for me at the start of this, I might've thought, wow, I, I didn't realize that's how much we're facing, but uh, that was the intent with how I wrote, drafted these up. Okay. Um, so see, uh, this one came out of some of the discussions with uh, uh, Michael, Greg. I'm sorry, Scott. Michael's yep. got a, his uh, hand. Oh, up. I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, just a quick, quick question. What, what do you mean by above after rec recreation? I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not clear to me. Maybe it is to everybody else. I'm not clear about it. Uh, okay. Um, I have to look at that wording. So I'm, you know, referring to the dunes, the North Dunes area, and if we allow that bluff to uh, retreat, it's going to impact the, the dune habitat as well as like the volleyball court area, things like that. So that was the recreation above above the, the bluff or above the beach. The wording might not be the best there. Yeah, I would just suggest, I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I just think that it's not clear here. 
we could just word it yeah, okay. more specifically. Yeah, thank you. Dedicated sentence. That's all I had to say. Thank you. Got it. No, that makes sense. Thank you. Any other comments? No. Okay. Um, this next one was pretty much out of a, a Greg D'Ambrosio and a David Shaman's presentation about the seawall integrity um, being compromised uh, by the erosion um, on the relatively soft sandstone uh, base, and, and then also that uh, getting equipment access to different areas on the beach is becoming uh, increasingly limited um, with inundation and you know just sand not uh, not being allowed to you know uh, sand being gone to make it harder to move around the rocks and things like that. Um, the, um, so from here, I kind of move on to pretty general statements, but uh, clearly there's potential here for uh, uh, both private property and public infrastructure. Um, it is at risk, and we can debate how much, I suppose, but it is at risk. So this includes, you know, all the things that we know down there, the, the beach, access, beach access stairways, bathrooms, the armoring itself, scenic road, Ocean Avenue beach parking, and some utilities, and um, property generally along scenic road, and then also adjacent to the to North Dunes area. Yeah, I would say, um, I think uh, looking at this sentence on this piece of paper here, um, you know, there's sort of two, there's a section of scenic road that I think a lot of people, we often forget about, which is the section between the uh, Del Mar parking lot and 8th Avenue that's on the outside of scenic road. And they have a very different problem than they have a very different problem than the people south of 8th Avenue because they are not protected by sea walls, they're protected by sand dunes. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So maybe we, maybe that's, um, you know, in this sentence you've called out along scenic road and maybe the phrase along scenic road needs to be replaced by sort of those two groups of homes. You know, one being north of 8th Avenue and one being south of 8th Avenue. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense, Scott? Yeah, I, I I think it does. I did use the term adjacent to North Dunes to, to trying to capture that, but I think it's in it's not very clear. So I I think the rewording something yeah, along the lines you suggested yeah. might be better. Yeah, I think when I think about the houses, when I think about adjacent to the North Dunes, I think about you know the two sort of new houses, you know the the big house and the two new houses that are on the that are up on the cliff above, right above the beach, down at the, at the north end, and then sort Got of it. Yeah. sand and sea. You know, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what the risk is at sand and sea, but I think of those homes, not the homes on the other side of the Delmar parking lot. Got it, yeah, okay, I'll clarify that uh, in some form. Okay. Any other inputs? All right. Um, I think you know throughout this uh, process that we'll be going through with this. Certainly, education is a big topic. Um, I mentioned a couple times, and I have it here's one identified. You know, issue. There's some remaining issues related to that too as we go along, but uh, education is is got, you know for the community to understand the, the the context for when these solutions get proposed is going to be important. And maybe there's some education up front even before we start proposing solutions. I'm not sure about that, but I think it's just an important uh, theme. Yeah, I think this is really important. I just, you know, I, I can't, I wish we could have like three bullet items with this in here um, to emphasize how important, how important this is. Yeah. Okay. Um, so if you could go ahead and scroll, Anya, to the remaining issues section. Now here's where <laughs> I could definitely use some some thinking around this uh, and input. Um, I made it easy on myself because uh, I struggled with knowing how to divide up what would be a remaining issue that we take on before our final report, which I guess is a year or so out to the council, versus what we would recommend to the council. 
And it was hard for me to know how to divide that up. And it really hinged largely in my thinking upon whether or not we engage a coastal engineer, you know, with some experience in planning for climate change in LCP context, as I wrote here. If we can, if we have a coastal engineer, I think we can start making progress on these next sub bullets under that. Without that uh, consultant, I'm not sure how much we can do because these are complicated issues. And so I, I did attempt to kind of break it up because I know we, we don't have, uh, may not have the funds to do this, but in the end it was just, it was awkward. So I sort of simplified things for this draft and I put, um, you could say I made an assumption, although I don't know if it's a good one, that we do have a coastal engineer involved. And if we do, these are the, the things that um, the engineer would be working with us on, you know, further assessment of these risks so we get a better understanding of, you know, what, you know, what, you know, what we're likely to face. And then determining adaptation you know, measures and LC LCP policy options. And then I've kind of walked through some s specifics below that. But I just, you know, just so you know, I, I, do, I know we don't necessarily have the funds today, and, and I don't know if we will, but uh, um, for now, I've organized it this way. And uh, with that, let me just go ahead and walk through some of these bullets and then uh, take any uh, feedback you have. Um, so uh, these first couple uh, prioritize adaptations and projects that protect and maintain public resources and beach access and, uh, and the viability of the community in, uh, in particular tourism here and also coordinating with regional partners. Those two bullets are things that um, I was hearing quite strongly um, out of that workshop from the Coastal Commission and some of the other uh, communities that are a little further along than us. And if these things are taken into account, we have a better chance at funding. And I think it's things you want to, we want to take into account anyway, but I just also wanted to put that overlay on it that these are the kinds of things that the Coastal Commission are saying that they'd be looking for, not protecting you know one house at a time or this sort of thing. Um, if there's something that we're looking to do that would um, you know prioritize these things and and possibly is there a need to coordinate for Carmel Cove at large, the, the beach at large with Pebble Beach, I don't know. But if there's something of that nature in there, our our chances of funding would be much greater. So that's kind of one rationale for it, but also it just seems like it's the right thing to do anyway. But I, I want to just provide that background. Um, one of these things that, um, well, the next bullet then is talking again about some of these uh, uh, different situations we have along our coastline. So, um, and it's gonna take different strategies and different options, maybe different phasing. We have the mostly uh, natural unarmored North Dunes that we spoke a bit about. We have the armored bluffs adjacent to, to Scenic Avenue. Um, we have the bluffs and dunes that we also just spoke of adjacent to the private lands on either side of North Dunes. So I kind of lumped those together. Um, but I, I guess I think I'm trying to get at that Del Mar Dunes area um, in particular, um, where those houses have no armory. It's, it's sand dunes that are protecting them today. So we have, we're gonna, that's gonna require different options and strategies and possibly different timing of, uh, of those uh, for that area. Um, one thing, another thing that came out strongly in that workshop was to really be thinking about feasibility and phasing. Um, you know, it can, if you start to address all these things at one time, it's just, it's probably mo monumental, but um, the, the Coastal Commission and the other communities that are into this are saying, you know, think about um, phasing and also you, in terms of there might be some triggers or thresholds for when you um, implement different strategies. Um, so I put an example in here where you might maintain armory or other defenses up to a point, but then if a threshold is reached, you uh, might need to uh, embrace a new bluff line or different adaptive measure. So these are the kinds of things that were getting discussed quite a lot in that workshop uh, for how to deal with things. I know, you know, Carmel challenges might be in one hand kind of small versus some of these other communities, but uh, I think in some ways they're no less complex when you start factoring in these kinds of uh, phasing and uh, variable situations. 
And then finally, of course, you know, legal liabilities, um, building coastal armoring and building regulations, real estate disclosures, fiscal impacts, these are all other things that need to be factored in, which make this whole thing pretty darn complex in my mind. And again, kind of points back to why I think we may need, certainly, uh, um, you know, we're gonna need some expert in, input it, probably from a coastal uh, um, engineer with some specific um, expertise in this area. So that's a probably good point to pause and see if we have any comments or inputs on, around that. So, uh -huh. yeah. Um, so I guess I'm thinking this should just be, this first bullet should be move to possible actions to be recommended. To With all the sub bullets or? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was another way to put it, I think. Yeah. I think, yeah. I'm, I want to hear from anybody yeah. else, but go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, I was going to say, I think that was, the, you know, when Scott and I were sort of talking about this last week, that was the big issue. You know, where does this, you know, does this work need to get done? you know, before, so let's assume that we're going to turn in our report next August. Is this before next August or after next August? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. yeah, so that's the issue. I'm not, I'm not sure I'm in agreement with you, Carrie, that we should postpone it, um, I, you know, that we shouldn't try to make an effort to get this done because I think this is sort of, I think this is the marquee issue mm -hmm. um, here. So that's my. I'm not. I'm not yet on board with with that. Um, well, I think I don't. I don't know how Anya is or Evan feel about this, but um, Anya's had her hand up. You could ask her. Did she? Oh, <laughs> I don't see it. Uh, uh, Anya, what do you think? Uh, um, well, I had a couple thoughts that came to mind. Um, I, I think, yes, hiring coastal engineer is going to be kind of mm -hmm. probably going to be something we're going to want to do. Um, there are a couple of other things we can consider recommending in the meantime that might get us moving forward. Uh, based on the, uh, the presentation from David Seanman, uh, he had pointed out, I think he had 10 sort of hotspot areas that were of particular concerns based on past storms. Um, we could recommend a coastal maintenance inspection program, which I don't believe is currently happening, um, mm -hmm. so that we stay up to speed on at least uh, how our our coast is changing um, and how our bluffs are, because right now we're working off of not, ha we have some data, but we're not, we're not constantly sort of checking on it. And so I think that would be helpful for us to consider um, and would help us sort of maintain what we already have. I think that's helpful, but it doesn't really address the bigger no, not need, which is to have, uh, you know, a climate change plan. Yeah, not so not it's long. A very time. very small step to just kind of keeping things going. And so uh, I, I don't disagree with it. I just not sure it's moving us very far forward in, in terms of outlining what our broader set of steps need to be. Yeah, no, I'm thinking of that in terms of like an early, you know, an early threshold kind of a. A short -term um, short, a more short-term action that we could recommend that might, you know, at least help uh, move the needle. Another thing I was cons thinking about. Can I stop you for a second on this? Yes, go ahead. Um, I think that, you know, one of, I know, one of the things that Karen Folito and I have talked about for the past that's been on her radar for years is that the shoreline management plan requires, you know, says that we're supposed to be doing this and we don't. So I don't think it's a, I don't think it's, to me, and, and you should, and please correct me on this if this is not what you were talking about. Um, I think it's a more a matter of just having the will and the funds, the resources to do the work, not necessarily to um, scope out what work there is to do, right? It's more, uh, right. there's not much planning to do because the planning has already been done. It's identified in that document. Is that right? 
Yes, I don't know if the top 10, you know, issue areas are, hi are highlighted in the shoreline management plan, but they may be. Uh, but yes, you're right. It's, it's refocusing on, on that aspect if we think that's a priority. Um, the other thing I was thinking about, uh, which the coastal engineer may not, may or may not uh, be able to help us with is, uh, we talked about sand supply and I think that's gonna be kind of critical. Um, I don't know if we might be able to work with CSUMB on figuring if, if they might have some scientists that might be interested in doing a study on our coastal sand supply locally, because uh, that might be beyond what a coastal engineer might be able to help us with based on the data we currently have. That's just a thought. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe there was one to read that, on that. Maybe, okay. So at least we could capture it just by putting the word "sand supply." Some, you know, putting yeah. in, in, in you know, uh, enshrining that comment into these bullets somewhere. And you're talking about studying sand supply, specifically researching to understand what the movements are on and offshore and impacts of armory, that sort of thing? Yeah, we really don't have that information right now, and I think yeah. it would be. I think that, that a coastal engineer would cover that topic, but um, I also think it is something we could suggest in the meantime that we try and look into. There was one other lead from uh, out of the USGS presentation. I, I don't know exactly what her focus is, but um, this person that's in the last bullet here uh, over at NPS, she's, I believe, does quite a bit of work on sand uh, movement up and down the coast. And, she, and so possibly we could reach out to her too. Michael, do you wanna chime in? <laughs> I, I just, hasn't, hasn't uh, David Shonen been doing our coastal assessment reports I mean, to meet that requirement that you guys were talking about? I mean, that was that was my understanding. We we had a uh, coastal assessment report, you know, given to uh, planning commission, you know, a couple of years back by David. And I, I, I assumed that was, there was some discussion at that time about, you know, the requirement and the length of time. And, and, and so there was, that's why he was, uh, you know, contacted to, to do that. I haven't seen one in the past couple of years. I remember seeing, um, I remember seeing one when I was on Forest and Beach, which was probably about four years ago. I don't know um, if there's been one since then. Well, essentially, the the presentation he gave to us, the committee, is is the same presentation, the same report that he gave to the planning commission. Now, I I can't remember the exact timeline. Could have been three, four years ago. It seems to me it was a little sooner than that, but but it was my understanding that, that was to meet the requirement to. Uh, do a periodic coastal assessment. And it was essentially the same same presentation that we received. Right, but that presentation wasn't the assessment. It was just about sort of about the assessment, right? I mean the assessment. No, it was it was the it was the assessment. That was the assessment report, as I understood it. I, unless unless there's something about it that you felt was deficient. I think uh, he, he I, I remember pretty, pretty, what I remember from about four years ago was that the assessment was sort of an, an engineering perspective of what's going on with all of the, so for example, stairways and what's going on with all of the revetments. That right, but that's what, that's what David Schoen went over in his report. It was all in the report. We just saw it. He talked about the stairways. He talked about the revetments. He talked about uh, you know the condition of them. He showed us all the outfalls onto the beach. I mean, it was pretty, pretty comprehensive. So okay. I don't know what, you know, I, I mean, I'm, I'm only bringing it up because I thought that was the assessment report. Okay. I thought, I thought it was what they did back in the eighties, not what needs to be done now. So what they did in the eighties is a kind of a picture of what we're going to have to do um, going forward because of um, the increase in, in um, the sea level rise. What do you, yeah, so, I what agree. Do you, I think 
one of these is an operational maintenance uh -huh. topic and the other is long-term planning for climate change. I just, I don't see them, not that there's no connection, but uh, I think we're kind of mixing a lot of operational stuff here that I don't- Yeah, we're getting close to, to, we're getting close to six too, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> I don't know, my thought is we need to be thinking a little broader time scale and, and not get bogged down on whether we're following our operation plan personally. I know it gives us something to put down in our report, but I don't know that it's it's all that meaningful, frankly. Mm -hmm. Well, I think this is, I mean, to that, and here I am belaboring the point. I would say to that, I would say to that, um, you know, this is an opportunity for us to at least put a, for us to put a stick in the ground about doing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe it's not 100% on topic, maybe it's 80% on topic. But um, I agree with, I sort of agree with Anya that we should mention it somewhere, something mm -hmm. about keeping up with the shoreline. Yeah, okay, okay, that's, that's, that makes sense. Well, and, you know, our, part of our charge here is to make recommendations for capital improvements um, to the city council. Um, so, what, what we're having kind of a problem with here is we don't know if we have any funding to start this. Um, you know, that's not to say uh, we couldn't, you know, bring it to the council before the reports do. Um, so uh, trying to get a sense of, you know, this is, this is a big part of what we need to recommend. Absolutely. Um, so, how do we go about that? So I think this is a good discussion in this group of what we really want to put forward, both in the short term and the long term. Mm -hmm. And I, there are a couple short term things here, by the way, beyond that first big collection of bullets under the right. coastal engineer. But mm -hmm. um, there is some funding out there, by the way, that the state's putting out. They just awarded 8 million funding. And this includes for planning. It's not just for projects, and they're getting ready to award more. They're very interested to, to see planning, serious planning getting underway. So they, if we write it up the right way, maybe we can fund a coastal engineer and some of this work that way. So I wouldn't rule that out. I know we've talked about FEMA disaster, you know, preparation or positioning for that um, right. type of funding. So, and then I, I already mentioned the person over at uh, NPS Mm -hmm. So there, you know, there's a couple things I, I guess we could start with. I just hope we don't, you know, miss the next year to, to at least start on some things that go beyond the maintenance and operation side. So what we could do, Jeff, is we could leave it as is. Um, so we keep a focus on it. And then depending on where we're at, when we start writing the report, there could be some movement. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a fine idea. I mean, the most important thing is that we have all the stuff we need and that we should be thinking about in this report. A little bit less so about which category it's in or whether we're going to get it done. Right. I think we need to produce a report and we'll just get as far as we get. And you know, I like the fact, Scott, that you outline. You know, your bullets in this are are really good, and it puts it at the forefront of what we need to get done as soon as we get some funding one way or the other. Mm -hmm. so, um, so the bullets are really good from my standpoint. Um, and so maybe we're just getting a little too picky here and that sometimes happens with reports. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. well, but, I struggle with the same thing, you know, where to put, like I said at the outside, you know, whether to put it as a pre-report or post-report recommendation, so. But I think it's good discussion because it keeps it top of mind for us. Mm -hmm. And I would say, honest, you know, I know you've been sort of collecting uh, dollar amount figures for the greenhouse gas emission work. Mm -hmm. um, so that we'll know, you know, and we may, Carrie and I have been talking about what we're going to do next month at the budget meeting, whether we're going to ask for money for that or not. And maybe this is another place where we could start collecting some figures because mm -hmm. maybe if there's not money to be gotten uh, next month, maybe there's money to be gotten in the next fiscal year or, um, for or, this work. Or Jeff, is it a matter of, is this more important than the greenhouse gas? 
So maybe we put this forward first. Yeah, we can have that. We can have that conversation. Gary, you and I can have that conversation, I guess. Mm -hmm. So uh, Anya is, you know, if you can kind of be thinking and Evan thinking about what, you know, I, I have no idea what this is going to take in terms of a engineer, a coastal engineer to take a look at our shoreline. We, um, we do have. It sounds a little scary to me, let me tell you. <laughs> yeah, we had some numbers uh, when we requested the vulnerability assessment, mm -hmm. uh, and there was something. There was some. There were some numbers related to the sea level rise. Let me let me go and look back at that in a little more detail. Thank you. Yeah. How does that sound, Jeff? Sounds great. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like Scott, we want to we want to leave your report alone when it comes to um, the remaining issues. Okay. Yeah, and then like you said, we can adjust as we get closer to the day. But at least we're kind of keeping it in one place. And you know, the end point is we do need to update our general plan, our mm -hmm. our you know local coastal plan, and and get buy off from the coastal commission. So, um, mm -hmm. but that's not all going to happen in a year, of course. But I mean. So that's all you really see out in the possible recommendations is primarily that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the input. I appreciate it. Um, hmm. You know, Carrie, I just said that you and I would have that discussion, but I'm not, I'm, I'm wondering whether we should have that discussion as a committee um, before we get to the February meeting. Yeah. Um, I don't want to, um, maybe the eight of us, we could do a little show of hands or something about what um, what Carrie and I should, you know, how we should approach this when we get to the council. Mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. Can you uh, can you pose that question a little more specifically if you're going to ask for a show yeah, of hands? I guess, I guess, yeah, let me pose the question and then let me pose the question and then I'll I'll sort of refrain from giving my view until maybe until the end because I probably have the strongest views. Um, the question is, you know, so for example, and I'm going to simplify this: if we have two twenty thousand dollar tasks, one of which is to do the greenhouse gas modeling. So that we can predict, so that we can recommend measures to the council that we should implement, so that we are where we are, and where we need to be twenty years from now. And the other one is to hire this coastal geologist. Which of those tasks? Which of those two tasks is more important? Like, if we have to do one of them this year and one of them next year, or we can only do one of them, you know, how does the committee think about? What does the committee think about? Um, which one is preferable? Which one should? Which one do we definitely want to do, and which one do we really want to do? <laughs> well, if you're just if you're just asking which is the priority, to uh, do a greenhouse assessment assessment or to hire an engineer, I think this is my opinion. I think the uh, greenhouse gas assessment would take priority. But having said that, I think. In a way, they're both equally important because uh, <laughs> well, you, you said it yourself, Jeff. One's you more said, equal. One's more you equal. You said. Than the other. You, I mean, we all we all understand that uh, one of the big impacts we're going to have is uh, from climate change as a community is going to be to the beach, and there. And Scott Scott did a really comprehensive job here. This is right. Really good work, really Scott. Good. And you really identified what those impacts are going to be, even if. We don't know what the time frame is. We don't know what the dollar amount is. We don't know, you know, a lot of stuff about it specifically. But we know that those those are all the potential impacts, and we know with a relative certainty because of the modeling on sea level rise and also the, the uh, potential for the increase of, uh, of of storms. You know, the intensity of those. It, these are the kinds of things we're going to experience, and we've experienced them in the past. You know, so so all I'm saying is that, uh, you know, these are both equally important, but I think, 
you know, the, the, and the reason why I'm saying it's because the basis of climate change impacts are greenhouse gases. That's what it's all about, people. You know, okay. if, we, if we emit less greenhouse gases or we have a better understanding of what we're emitting, we have the greatest potential to affect, you know, climate change. I was just wondering, is there any uh, legislative deadline that would push us toward one or the other? Uh, so I, I would say, I mean, we could defer that to Anyas and send her back for some research, but I don't, I'm not sure that we have time to do that, Lynette. And honestly, you know, sort of given what we heard from Dave Stoll about the way that the city and the state enforces these rules, I'm, I'm not sure that we're going to be facing an enforcement action if we don't. You know, so how about we, why don't we make this decision? I would ask you, let's talk about the decision absent the legislative priorities. Um, Cause I think that will just, we'll just get all wound up around that. Does that make sense? Sure. So what do you think? Well, um, I would struggle. It's like splitting the baby, I guess, in a way. Um, I agree with Michael that greenhouse gas emissions are kind of the premier issue, but the visibility of the, uh, you know, the, the beach and the, co and the bluffs and the whole coastal issues, the visibility issue is greater on that one. Um, and I, I frankly can't imagine that we're only talking $20,000. I, I mean, I don't know if that was just a number pulled out of the air that we have two twenty thousand dollars Oh, okay. Because my guess is that it, in either case, it's going to be a more substantial number of, than that. I pulled, it, I pulled that number out of the air. Because, okay, okay. Because I think that that's the number that we have sort of for the greenhouse gas work. So it's pulled out. It's not pulled out of the air for the greenhouse gas work. I think it's relatively accurate for that, but I don't mm -hmm. have any idea what the. I don't have any idea what the geologist yeah. work number yeah. is. So, uh, so what does that mean, Lynette? You're like fifty-fifty. No, it doesn't mean I'm fifty-fifty. It means I have trouble deciding which ones. But we can't be fifty-fifty if we can only do one, um, and. I, I feel that if we're looking at a one-year deal, one-year deal, um, then we should go with greenhouse gas. But I don't feel that for the long run by any means. I feel really concerned. And um, the more I think about it, the more we learn about it, I feel that any deferral on some of the the learning that we need to know get on just where we are sure. with the beach and the bluffs and so on is is a huge so i'll go with greenhouse emissions because you know i feel pinned against the wall here <laughs> <laughs> all right john john's up go ahead yeah. john. well i have more of a question i guess I, what i'm struggling with is i don't know how you make recommendations if you don't have the information Exactly. Make a recommendation. And my question would be, it seems like there's a lot of information we don't have that we mm -hmm. need help with here. And I don't know in terms of greenhouse gas, and I don't know the answer. This is a question. Do we have this? Do we have more available information to be able to make recommendations or, or suggestions to the council more so than I mean, which which one of these two issues are we the most in the dark about, I guess? Oh, well, I think I think the issue is that we can't let me re, let me put this back to you. I mean, I think the issue is that these are two areas of the report that we can't complete on our own. And, you know, and so the question is, if we are only able to do one, you know, before before we are finished, which one would be a higher priority for the committee? And it's more, you know, there aren't concretes around the question. It's just the. Uh, you know, how do you view our project as a whole, given that, you know, given where we are with money, where we didn't expect to be and all that? Okay. Are you asking a question then? <laughs> 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 on the spot. Kind of pin you down, yeah. Uh -huh. 
Well, I don't know. That's a tough one. I guess uh, I think what Michael said is really true is that the greenhouse gas is the, you know, the, the issue that, that creates the other issue or light. So I guess that's probably more important. I think they're, it's 51% to 49 or, or we need the vice president's vote, I guess. <laughs> Scott? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'd probably go with that. I, the greenhouse gas, partly because I'm thinking about as being slightly more shovel ready, if you will. Like, I think we know more what we need to do and, and it's, we can make progress. If they, I, I'm a little unclear exactly what we're hiring the consultant to do, but uh, on that case, so I'm not completely informed, but my sense is that one is sort of teed up and we can make progress on it. And it's an important one. Meanwhile, I think there's a lot of things we can do for free I mean, in-house without a consultant to get ready for hiring the consultant on the uh, on the on the beach issue. So I, I feel like we should push forward on that, um, talking to experts who we can for free, looking into who the consultants are, um, checking to see if there's some funding out there, and so see how far we. Because I think we have some work to do before we're ready to bring on a consultant. So I just hope we could still make progress on that. So we're, I'm saying both, but for the money, put it on greenhouse gas. That's my thought. Anya and Evan. So, from a from a project standpoint, I would I would vote for greenhouse gas also because so also to answer Scott and John, whom I think were questioning what we need a consultant for on the greenhouse gas side of thing. Um, that is for uh, greenhouse gas emissions forecasting and for um, giving us estimates of greenhouse gas reductions of different uh, potential policies or projects that we might propose. So we don't have the in-house uh, expertise to, to do that. Uh, we would need a consultant to help us with that. Uh, so that's 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 the use of the consultant in, in, in that case. Um, I would vote for that only because without that, we're pretty much uh, stopped on that side of the project until until we can have a consultant help us with that. Like we're a little bit on pause uh, on the on the climate adaptation side of things, you know, the beach is sort of an element onto itself and we can, as Scott mentioned, we can continue making progress even on that element, but we can also continue making progress on other elements of the, the adaptation right. planning um, without a coastal engineer hired. So that would be why I would recommend. Evan? Yeah, I was always, Hold on, let me put my, uh, or can you hear me okay? I'm yeah. Speaker. Okay, I have speaker issues sometimes. Um, I was always going to go with uh, the greenhouse gas emission. Um, the reason on yes gave was much better than the reason I was going to give. Um, okay. She kind of, she kind of gave me a, you know, an, an idea I didn't think of before, but I mean, I, you know, there's so much more to the adaptation plan than just the beach um, that we can continue to work on, but you know, it, without having someone to assist us with the forecasting, we aren't going to have a um, certified climate action plan. If it's not certified, we can't use it when we get around to our general plan update. You know, it's, to me, I don't see a point in only kind of going halfway with the um, climate action plan, you know, if, if it's not going to be able to be certified. Um, you know, it's a it's a fun exercise, but it doesn't, you know, help us in any way. Um, if we, you know, if we are able to put one other item off for a year, we can keep working on, you know, everything else that goes along with the uh, the adaptation plan, and then loop back around to uh, the issues specifically on the beach. Okay, um, Carrie. Um, so I think part of it is hiring an engineer. You're, you're not going to do it for 20, 20 grand. Uh, they're, they're expensive. Um, so part of it is a fiscal issue for me. Um, so if you look at climate change, of course, we are 
in deep about what we uh, want to do about climate change. Do people on the outside of our climate change world, are they committed to the greenhouse gas issue? Or do they think that the beach bluff is more of a visual, and so that's more important? Mm -hmm. I, I'm, 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 putting, I'm putting that out there. <laughs> Ellen, <what? laughs> um, I, I see her. But do you understand what I'm saying for us? That's a great question. The greenhouse gas for us, you know, we want to champion because we want to make res recommendations. But, you know, I'm thinking of other people that we need to pitch this to. And so um, is that, is the greenhouse gas emission, that is really what we're trying to do, but people outside of our shell here, um, are they going to buy that in this economic challenging times? Well, Carrie, that's what I meant when I first said about, you know, they're both important and is the vis visibility mm -hmm. of the beach bluff question so great that we would be pushed in that direction. What, as, as everybody has been talking, one of the things that has come to mind is maybe what we say is that these are both urgent and important issues, but given the fiscal constraints at the city level, we would go with the greenhouse gas emissions now and make a genuine attempt to gain some money from the state to do our planning and discovery work on, on the beach and the bluff. I mean, it, $8 million is not a whole lot of money mm -hmm. for the state to have released. Did I hear that right, Scott? That's what they just released. And yeah, I think yeah, another I mean, it's something cool amount we, coming up this year. There's no yeah. reason why we couldn't try to go after that mm -hmm. so that it doesn't appear either to members of the council or to the community at large that we don't feel that the beach and bluff situation is important because I, I hear what you're saying. I definitely hear that. Ellen, do you want to comment before we go turn to Jeff? <laughs> uh, yes, I think um, logistically the climate change needs to be put out there, as Evan said, as a, to substantiate <clears throat> what we're asking for, and that's the way government operates. However, there could be some way to put a bow on that that shows some visuals of the bluff to just say people, this is what's going to happen to the bluff as a result of the climate change. Mm -hmm. It's not as strong as having just a report on that, but if there was some way to kind of put a bow on, mm -hmm. on it. Michael? Okay. Uh, I mean, originally we had a budget amount that was allocated from the council, right? And then as right. uh, because of COVID, that that had to be uh, rescinded. What, what was that we amount? We had $55,000. And, and Anya's, did we ever have a, a bid or a, an amount uh, that we knew that to, to do the greenhouse grass assessment? Did we have that? Did we ever get that far? We we don't have a like a bid. Yeah, did we ever we get did. a we get a request for proposal, RPM? Did we ever yeah, we did a, an RFP for that. Or, we yeah. Yeah, did talk to other municipalities about some costs, uh, some you know estimates of how much it costs for them, and that's mm -hmm. where we came up with the you know the under twenty thousand dollars. The greenhouse gas element with, with the original that's where you came with the original budget of 50,000. No, the 55,000, I don't know exactly where that came from. That had that was not that was not related to climate action at the time. I believe that had to do with potentially uh, the more the vulnerability side of things, the climate adaptation. Mm -hmm. But I'm not, I'm not sure where that number okay. came from. Well, the only reason I brought up, I just thought it may be a good strategy to present to the uh, the council for a uh, a budget item. 
is to reclaim it. Yeah, exactly. To get back to parity, to get back where we were, you know. Because I think, I think uh, for myself and maybe for the other community, that, the Ooh, committee, that yeah. was kind of a big disappointment Ooh. when that money was taken away. I mean, I understand totally why it was, but oh, yeah. um, it, it, it was, uh, it really was a disappointment and, and I felt like it, it hindered us. So I feel very strongly that the work this committee is doing is very important. And uh, so I think we need to get back to parity and are back to where we were. And, and I think that's a strong argument that could be presented to the council. So. Thank you. All right, Jeff. So what were, what Mike yeah, I, You know, I'm thinking back to, you know, Anya mentioned the $55,000 and I think that was the number that we were given by Bob Harari. I think it was just a number that was pitched out at the budget meeting, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a couple of years ago. And, you know, it was like my first budget meeting, like four months into my tenure. And, oh, here's $55,000 for climate change. Great. Let's just take it. Mm -hmm. and, and then what happened was when, when we formed the commission at the end of um, 2018, I, I think, and Carrie, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm remembering this wrong, but it was really important to me that we do, that we did climate action. And, and so I sort of strong armed that into, into the sort of scope of work of what the eight of us were gonna do. Because mm -hmm. I, felt pretty, I felt pretty strongly about that. And I think like everybody, um, that everybody, all of you that I'm looking at, I still feel very strongly about it. Um, I feel like that's an important part of, um, of what we should be doing. You know, I talk a lot you know, I think about our participation in sort of the bigger world and the bigger community and the and and all that. And I think climate, the climate action stuff, is how we do that. You know, it's how we show the world that we're you know that we're thinking about other people other than ourselves. And that's a message that I think is good for Carmel to send. And in addition to the fact that I think it's just sort of morally right that we do that. So I think so. I do think that that's important. Um, I think Anya expressed my views um, best in that I sort of view this as, you know, these projects are going to be going on forever. You know, mm -hmm. we may have a permanent climate action committee that meets every other month or once a quarter or whatever. And we'll be talking to all of you individually about that um, in a couple of years, um, whether you want to, whether you want to participate in that. But I think that if we don't, you know, I think that, you know, we could we could pretty much write an adaptation report now that would get us through that would be a good start for the next climate action next committee. Like I don't I think it would be pretty thin, but I know that we have some information where we could say, you know, here's what we were able to get done with no money and you know, we'll have the next committee take it and move forward. And I think that sort of continuity is really important. And I think what Anya said about without the greenhouse gas work, we're just stuck. Like there is no path forward. Like, you know, and what Evan said about having a certified plan, there is no path forward to producing that at all if we don't do that work. Mm -hmm. And so I see that side of the project as being really stuck, you know, like really stuck and we need to unstick it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why, I have a pretty strong preference for making our pitch, making our pitch that way first. And to Carrie's point about, you know, have, you know, we have to sell it to the council. I would say, yeah, we have to sell it to the council. Maybe the council won't buy it. Um, you know, that's the council's prerogative of which Carrie and I are two members and, you know, Karen and Dave and Bobby are the other three members. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we won't be able to get another member to buy it you know, to buy what the committee says, or maybe Carrie will switch. I don't, I don't know. Um, certainly I'll be talking to Carrie about this. <laughs> but I think that, uh, I think that it's a good plan for the committee to go in with a recommendation, like here's what we want, here's what we think is right. Mm -hmm. And I think that carries a lot of weight mm -hmm. um, with other council members as it should. Mm -hmm. You know, we've been doing this work and this is what the eight of us think is right. So what I'm hearing, what I would, what I'm hearing is that we want to have a sort of a recommendation for the greenhouse gas work, mm -hmm. and then Carrie mm -hmm. and I will sort of 
I'm asking you for permission, you know, the, the eight of you, the six of you, not including me and Carrie, that we'll have some permission to wiggle around a little bit as far as getting the second pot of money and we'll do the best that we can, mm -hmm. you know, whether it's this fiscal year or that fiscal year. And we'll talk to Chip about it, mm -hmm. you know, as the budget is being prepared um, and we'll see where we are. Mm -hmm. You know, well, I think we'll find out, you know, we talked about finding out about the green, about the first, you know, about asking for some money next month. And I, and I, um, 60% sure we'll do that, you know, because mm -hmm. we're having a sort of a budget reconciliation, you know, a big budget meeting as part of our council meeting next February. And we'll ask for money then, mm -hmm. which is why we're having this conversation. And then we'll work sort of in a slightly longer term to figure out what we can do mm -hmm. for uh, sort of the next fiscal year. So does so, that sound? Mm -hmm. I think what I'm hearing is we need to grab what we can get done. And the grabbing, hopefully, is the greenhouse gas for around 20,000. And I like the approach of that the, the climate committee is making that recommendation. So I think that's a great idea. So is Robert, there any money left over from anywhere? Well, that's what we're, we're gonna, gonna have that discussion next month. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cause we would like, to, if, there, if there's anything that was, that our original $55,000 was then redirected to We'd really like to claim that as well. <laughs> well, I yeah. Think everything. I think everything was just axed. I don't yeah. think it. And it didn't. I, I like the way you think. <laughs> right. <laughs> we want to look at, under. Everything. I said I like the way she thinks. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, uh -huh. So part of our chefs and my challenge is that all the entire capital budget got axed. Um, so. You know, in terms of priorities, when you look at the whole city, um, you know, trying to finesse, um, you know, uh, and I, I believe that the rest of the council realizes that we've been working hard on this issue. And so um, I'm feeling comfortable with at least asking for the 20 grand. I would love to get more, but when you think about everything else that was axed, you know, you kind of get a little uncomfortable. <laughs> So, um, in the if you look at the big picture. So, but um, I appreciate people's um, um, letting us know that they they really want to get the greenhouse gas done. Yes, thank you, thank you for uh, sharing your thoughts with us. Yeah, um, it's six thirty. So, if anybody has any partner updates that they'd like to share with us right now, um, and you can be, I would ask you to be brief. Um, we can do that. Otherwise, we'll adjourn and we'll see you next month. Yeah, we Anybody? could. We could ask for partner updates via email. Uh, that would help us um, maybe do um, with the agenda for uh, February's meeting. Um, uh, so, uh, Anyas, can you remind us who we're thinking about for the presentations? Uh, so, I know we're we're going to kind of do maybe an update as well. So. Um, what, what do we have? We tentatively had uh, AMBAG with the 2018 okay. Greenhouse Gas Inventory mm -hmm. and uh, 3CE, the Coast, Central Coast Community Energy uh, with uh, their climate action projects and uh, their uh, new procurement uh, energy procurement strategy uh, that they're you know working on or working on getting approved and rolled out and how that would affect uh, climate action plans uh, for local municipalities mm -hmm. okay so we've got some uh, good presentations planned yeah so and that's we have, and we have pg and e still yeah so. right and pg and e uh, would be another one uh, it is tentative uh, for AMBAG at the moment. I, I needed to confirm with them whether they're going to be, they're going to have all their data, you know, in a row. But um, working on it. Okay. All right. How's that sound? Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for hanging in there yeah. until 6 30 yeah. and helping us, helping Carrie and I with this little yeah. dilemma. Yeah. And we'll see Great. you all in the yeah. next all right. Thank Bye -bye. you. Appreciate it. Bye. Appreciate your time.
Tschüss.